Dear Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, we cordially invite you to be seated and silent because in a few minutes, the event will start. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. The Honorable Head of Aquatic Product Technology Department, Dr. Roni Nugraha, SSC MSC, Director of Global Connectivity, IPB University, Dr. Eva Angraini, our speakers, Dr. Lik Tong Tan and Dr. Robert Kaisers, the lecturer from all universities, and also all the participants from many countries, like, of course, Indonesia, and we, say, and we have also from Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Tanzania and Yaman that could attend to this special event. Let me introduce myself first. My name is Alia Balfas, IBB University Ambassador. It's a precious chance for me to be a master ceremony on this very special occasion in the national webinar on marine bioprospecting. First of all, let's say thanks to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala who has given us guidance, happiness, help, and mercy, so we can attend and participate in this special virtual event without any obstacles. It's an honor for Aquatic Product Technology to conduct the international webinar on marine bioprospecting. The first agenda is welcoming speech by head of Aquatic Product Technology Department, Dr. Roni Nugraha, SSE MSJ. For Dr. Rani Nugraha, time is yours. Okay, before uh, we move to the welcoming speech, there's a uh, rules of webinar. The first one is uh, participant, please turn on your camera and use the virtual background in the photo session. Participants can turn off the camera when the speakers have a presentation. Also, participant, please have chance to display name into full name and its current institution. Turn off your mic while the speakers have presentation and raise your hand if you have a question in the discussion section. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the first agenda is welcoming speech by head of Aquatic Product Technology Department, Dr. Roni Nugraha, SSC MSC. For Dr. Roni Nugraha, time is yours. Alia, I think Pak Roni is still trying to connect. So, don't me. Uh, okay, maybe uh, we should uh, jump to the opening speech, ma'am. Shall I start or Ibu Gusti? So, okay. Uh... First, we have an opening speech by Director of Global Connectivity, IPB University, Dr. Eva Andraini. For Dr. Eva Andraini, I miss yours. 
Thank you, Alia. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Honorable Dr. Lik Tong Nan, Dr. Lik Tong Tan yeah, from Nanja, Nanyang Technology University, Singapore. Uh, Honorable Dr. Robert Kaisers, Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Um, our speakers today and uh, the head of Department of um, Fisheries Technology, Dr. Roni, and uh, Ibu Kusti, Dr. Kusti Arya, uh, who has organized this event and uh, hosting uh, the webinar. And um, to all of the participants, um, very well welcome uh, for uh, this webinar meetings. And uh, I think this is a real important topics that we have we, we are discussing today about an international webinar on marine bioprospecting. So uh, if you look at um, recently development uh, that we are aware that um, the, the development at the global level has been uh, promoting more to uh, environmentally and sustainable way and um, bioprospecting and also like uh, other uh, green economy or blue economy uh, has been uh, promoting has been promoted um, within the last few years. And I think this is an important for the, for the economy of the global and of also the national, uh, how to uh, accelerate the economy, but uh, not depend on the uh, extraction uh, sectors. I mean, like extraction-based sectors. Uh, Indonesia, uh, for example, that we, we, are, we have, um, um, rich uh, natural resources, and uh, we also have um, a biodiversity and uh, yeah, based on the natural resource and environment. And uh, our economy um, still depends on the, the, the extractions, yeah? I mean, like, uh, like um, uh, mining sectors or fisheries sectors, um, uh, agriculture sectors. Uh, which have which mainly focus on the extractions and um, now we 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 try to uh, shift uh, to the 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 economy based on non extractive um, activity and I think uh, uh, bioprospecting is one of them uh, in uh, uh, in addition to like uh, maybe green economy or uh, green carbon or blue carbon, maybe you are also have been familiar with this issue that um, um, since la um, yeah few decades that um, carbon has been traded and uh, it becomes um, a source of economy. I mean, like it generate income for the nation, for the community. And Indonesia would uh, also like to uh, active in this uh, in this trade actually, and one of the uh, important agenda for the Indonesian government currently uh, is to include uh, blue carbon in the uh, enhanced national determined contributions in terms of uh, blue carbon, in terms of carbon. Where uh, for the green carbon we have submitted like the second. Uh, for enhanced and uh, uh, nationally determined contributions. And it means that um, by including uh, the blue carbon, uh, it, it strengthens the positions of marine and fishery sector, that we um, can promote uh, 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 marine resources, environmental services provided by marine as uh, a source of uh, sustainable economy. Uh, so uh, uh, aligned with this uh, development, I think bioprospecting is also uh, one uh, sector that uh, that uh, need to be developed. Uh, uh, from what, from my knowledge, um, yeah, we have already uh, research or innovations 
that um, uh, support the development of uh, bioprospecting. Uh, yeah, what I know, like for example, in the department of the uh, fisheries technology, that there are um, research uh, from the biodiversity that has been developed and to produce many products. Um, and this, uh, of course, um, um, uh, become the uh, income generation for 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 uh, for the economic uh, actors. And uh, I think this research should be um, uh, promoted, should be uh, encouraged in the future, because uh, I think Indonesia should lead um, in this bioprospecting, uh, in uh, either yeah, both in the research and innovations, and also in the uh, uh, economy or in the uh, trading itself. I mean, like of course. At the end, by prospecting, we we uh, we put them as the um, source of economy. This is what what what, what uh, the the most important uh, role of this bio prospecting, and um, with the the development of the society, uh, I'm I feel confident that. Uh, Gradually, the community also they they have uh, more preference on um, natural products uh, coming from the resources which are not um, uh, made produced by uh, uh, extracting or destructed uh, destructive uh, ways, and this becomes uh, of course at the end it will uh, balance the economy and the environment. So I think um, this uh, seminar, uh, this webinar is really in line with uh, our visions uh, uh, in the future, particularly uh, IPB, uh, that uh, we uh, have been really focused on bioeconomy um, as uh, part of uh, what we call it, uh, engine of, of growth. So uh, if you remember, like since like 2018, actually we have, uh, established um, um, a roadmap for uh, uh, developing innovations which can promote the sustainability and also to uh, uh, to increase the uh, added value and uh, uh, um, to uh, to uh, promote the environmental services so by by uh, enhance uh, maintaining our ecosystem, but uh, at the same time, we increase our capacity in research and innovation to produce um, uh, what we call bioprospecting products, something like that. And this will be, um, yeah, uh, make uh, this will make our economy and, and environment uh, balance uh, uh, in the future. So I think uh, this is uh, uh, the importance of uh, this bio, the bioprospecting in in in, uh, in our uh, economy and and IPB as one of uh, leading university in Indonesia, which has focused on agriculture, marine and biosciences. I think uh, uh, there is no doubt that we have to uh, lead in this. Uh, sector as well. So uh, I think our Department of, of Fisheries Technology as one of uh, the department which develops science and uh, technology in uh, processing uh, in, uh, in, and also bioprospecting. I, uh, I really um, um, encourage uh, the departments, uh, the, the faculties to, uh, to do more research on this bioprospecting. I think uh, uh, I will stop there uh, for the opening speech and um, I wish you have uh, fruitful webinars and have more insight on how to develop bioprospecting in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Evan Raimi for opening speech. Next agenda is welcoming speech by Head of Aquatic Product Technology Department, Dr. Roni Nugraha, SSC MSG. For Dr. Nugraha, time is yours. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Aliyah. 
uh, hope my sound is clear and you can hear my speech. Okay, um, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, Dr. Eva, as the head of Global Connectivity, uh, the speakers, uh, and also the participants of today's uh, webinar on marine bioprospecting. Um, it is my uh, distinct pleasure to welcome you all to this highly anticipated webinar on marine bioprospecting. Uh, I think we gather today uh, from different uh, regions, I think not only from Indonesia, but also from abroad, uh, we we try to embark uh, on a fascinating journey uh, into our oceans. And uh, marine bi bioprospecting um, is a topic that get an interest from around the world, as we know that many um, molecules, many. Uh, uh, product from marine could influence our life, including health and also uh, foods as well. And also, uh, first and foremost, I would like to deliver our sincere gratitude to uh, our speaker today. We have Dr. Lik Tong Tan. Uh, from Nanyang Technology University, Singapore, and also Dr. Robert Deiser from Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Thank you for sharing uh, with us your knowledge on marine bioprospecting. Uh, how uh, we can gather, uh, we can improve our understanding on this uh, topic. The theme of today's webinar, uh, I think marine bioprospecting is an area of human significance and also possibilities. As Dr. Eva has mentioned before in her opening speech, we can uh, involve marine bioprospecting in blue economy, blue carbon, and also to improve our uh, life as well. Our ocean, uh, of course, cover more than two thirds of our planet and a home to a remarkable array of life forms, including uh, sponge, uh, bacteria, fungi, and I think many more uh, organisms. And these organisms remain undiscovered and also unexplored. And through uh, this topic, through this field, marine bioprospecting, we have the opportunity to unlock the secrets of these marine organisms. And of course, harness the incredible potential for applications in medicines, agriculture, industry, and beyond. And the university has a mission to be a research-based higher education and a prime mover of agriculture mainstreaming in bioscience and also um, agriculture, biotech and uh, marine maritime, including uh, our marine, marine, uh, marine science and marine uh, field as well. And we hope that in this webinar, we can get uh, knowledge, we can get uh, experience insight from the two speakers. And thus uh, we have um, empowering our deeper understanding of marine uh, bioprospecting immense potential. I think on my list, uh, we have uh, participants from different universities, from uh, Papua, from Aceh, from Kalimantan, and we also uh, from Abid and also from uh, Malaysia, and I think different different uh, countries as well. So once again, uh, I would like to welcome you to this webinar on marine bioprospecting. May uh, our collective efforts uh, bring us closer 
to this uh, wonder life uh, beneath our our uh, oceans. And our discoveries uh, may pave the way and for a brighter and more sustainable future. Uh, thank you uh, very much and enjoy the webinar. And hopefully we can have a very good discussion later on after the speakers and we can get a deeper understanding on this topic. Thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Niyugraha, for your welcoming speech. Now let's do a photo session. We will do a documentation of this special moment. So I would like to ask all the participants to turn on your camera, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are going to have a photo section. So please, for, for all the participants, uh, turn on your camera. We are going to take a photo in the first, uh, first page. Okay. <clears throat> One, two, and three. Okay, next slide. Uh, One, two, and three. Okay, the third slide. One, two, and three. Okay, the last slide. One, two, and three. Okay, thank you for turning on your camera. Uh, we can <clears throat> next the uh, event. Okay, thank you, Zahra. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to jump to our main agenda. Okay, our main agenda will be led by our moderator, Dr. Kustiaria Tarman, is a faculty member at the Department of Aquatic Product Technology Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, IPB University. She obtained her BSc and MSc from IPB University. At 2012, she finished her PhD in Pharmaceutical Biology at the Institute of Pharmacy, Greifswald University, in Germany. Since 2012, she has led the Marine Biotechnology Division Center for Coastal and Marine Resources to the IPB University. So without further ado, for Dr. Kustiaria, time is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Alia. Good morning, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's our honor today that we have uh, two experts on marine natural products. So Dr. Lee. Tong Tan from Nanyang Technology University. And for the next session, we have Dr. Robert Kaiser from Victoria University of Wellington. So for the first session, uh, Dr. Tan uh, will share his research on marine cyanobacteria as the source of uh, bioactive compounds with various uh, biological activities. So before his talk, let me introduce uh, with a short uh, bio graphy of Dr. Tan. So he obtained Bachelor of Science from the Department of Zoology at the National University of Singapore. And then he uh, did his master in Rukyu University, Okinawa, Japan for the marine science. And in uh, PhD, he did in Oregon State University in the US, uh, especially for the uh, biomedical potential of marine cyanobacteria under the uh, supervision of Professor William Kerwick, one of the uh, prominent uh, experts on marine natural products. And then he continued with a postdoctoral in San Diego 
under the professor of uh, William Fenical. So let me welcome, uh, let me uh, welcome uh, Dr. Tan, please join me. So please, Dr. Tan, time is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Taman, for the kind invitation uh, to talk about my, to share with, uh, with all of you my research that I've uh, been sort of uh, conducting in Singapore. So let me just share screen. Uh, okay. All right, hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, just looking at the time, it's about 10.30. Okay. So the title of my presentation today is on marine cyanobacteria, a treasure trove of bioactive compounds for drug discovery and development. So uh, I do a lot of things in my, re in my lab in Singapore, and cyanobacteria is one of my pet topics. Uh, where I look at the, you know, the chemistry in terms of the natural products and as well as the utility of these compounds in, from a biomedical perspective. So I come from the National Institute of Education, which is a, an institute uh, that's part within Nanyang Technological University. So NIE is actually a, a, a teacher training institute where we train students to become teachers. But within NIE, we do conduct content research as well. So, so in today's talk, um, this is the outline of my talk. And basically, I have three things to share with you. Of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of filamentous marine cyanobacteria as drug source. Of course, there are many different types of marine cyanobacteria. I'm, I'm going to focus on benthic filamentous type as a source of uh, very interesting molecules for drug discovery in drug discovery efforts. And I'm going to move quickly into um, to showcase four case studies uh, that stemming from my own research on marine filamentous cyanobacterial compounds isolated from um, in Singapore. I'm going to start off with um, uh, the first story is going to sort of focus on the classical way of uh, natural product drug discovery. Um, this is a story that was, uh, was done many years ago, more than 10 years ago, uh, which is still relevant today in terms of the, the molecule that have been discovered. Uh, and then I'm going to move quickly into some of the innovative technologies, basically the use of MS-based metabolomics approach for the discovery of, um, of natural products. And I'm going to end with a conclusion and some final thoughts on the drug discovery from nature, particularly from this part of the world in Asia. So um, I'm going to start with the first slide on just a, um, a general description of what cyanobacteria are. So these are basically classified with bacteria in the kingdom, within the kingdom of Monera. This is due to their prokaryotic nature. So these are prokaryotic organisms and they lack internal organelles, discrete nucleus and histone proteins. Uh, these are obviously ancient microorganisms. They are uh, attributed to putting out oxygen into the atmosphere with the oldest known fossils more than 3.5 billion years ago. So um, in terms of forms, these are this can be quite small and unicellular to filamentous, especially in bloom formation. And they're visible in nature as surface blooms in ocean or as mat formation. Now, when we look at the chemistry of cyanobacteria, it presents a genus phase nature of the uh, cyanobacterial chemistry. On one side, uh, it, some of these molecules produced by cyanobacteria poses public health issues. So, for example, from the freshwater strains or genus of cyanobacteria, uh, they produce toxic compounds such as microcystins. And these are cyclic peptides that can cause liver damage. Uh, on the other hand, oh, sorry, let me just continue with the public health issue. So another example would be uh, from the marine strain, you have the limbia toxin A as well as D-bromo toxin. These are compounds that can cause dermatitis as well as tumor promoters. Now, on the other side of the coin, you have compounds 
that are are beneficial they are benefit they have benefit beneficial properties in terms of the biomedical um, perspective. So this is something that I want to focus on for this talk. Uh, so basically, filamentous strain of marine cyanide bacteria uh, is a tremendous source of pharmaceuticals, and I shall show you some examples of it and success story as well. A lot of these compounds are structurally unique, and they range in terms of activity, they range from anti-cancer to anti-malarial uh, activities. Now, in terms of the, um, the breakdown of compounds from marine cyanobacteria, this slide shows you a lot of information. I just want to sort of quickly summarize. So in terms of the taxonomic order, um, I'm not sure if you can see it's on top right, top left corner, um, majority of these compounds are actually coming from four major orders. Uh, majority, and, and one of the, one such order, the Oscillatorelis, uh, contribute to almost 60% of the molecules. Now, if you look at the uh, percentage of marine cyanobacterial natural products by genus at the bottom right corner, you'll notice that uh, a lot of these compounds are actually coming from Lingbia uh, genus, um, coupled with uh, Moria. So it's been the some of these uh, strains have been revised to a Moria genus. So Lingbia slash Moria genus uh, contributes to a majority of these um, bioactive compounds. Now, when we look at the major classes of natural products produced by marine cyanobacteria, you can loosely classify them into four uh, classes. Of course, the top, uh, the, the first class, the hybrid polyketide non-ribosomal peptides forms the majority of these uh, marine cyanobacterial compounds, followed by polyketides, uh, which are synthesized by the polyketide synthetase modular enzymes. And then you have the non-ribosomal peptides. These are uh, peptides, uh, linear peptides or cyclic peptides that are produced by the non-ribosomal peptide synthetases. And then you have this emerging class of um, cyanobacterial compounds known as the cyanobactins, which is, a, which, are, uh, which is classified as a subclass within the RIPP pathway. This, is, this would be the ribosomally synthesized and post-translationally modified peptides. So these class of cyanobactins are quite different from the rest in the sense that they are synthesized ribosomally. Now, this is just a few examples, just a snapshot of four examples of lead compounds from some marine cyanobacteria. and bacteria. As I mentioned previously, they have diverse activity. So you have Santa Crucemide A, as well as Lagozole. These are two lead compounds that have been isolated from Simploca genus. Uh, and they have potent anti-cancer activity, specifically as histone deacetylase inhibitors. And then you have another, the third example of the tasiamide B, uh, which is the elite molecule for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And lastly, you have galilamide A, uh, which, is, uh, has, which has potent anti-malarial activity. So these are just four examples of many other um, you know, lead compounds that have been derived from cyanobacteria. And you also notice that all these four compounds are coming out from Simploca or extracted from Simploca um, genus, which is, um, I showed a picture in the top right, top left corner. So one of the success story of, um, of a cyanobacterial compound that have been developed into a drug is this molecule here. This is a antibody drug conjugate, ADC. Um, an example would be a cetris. So you will notice that the, this particular molecule has a cytotoxic drug that is linked via a linker uh, to an antibody. So this, this um, a cetris drug is actually quite specific in terms of targeting uh, CD30 receptors that's overexpressed on cancer cells. And you will notice that in the cytotoxic drug that's been thetated onto the antibody is actually a synthetic molecule deriving from a dolestatin 10, uh, right at the bottom, dolestatin 10, which is a cyanobacterial compound uh, used as a lead 
molecule for the development of vindotin, uh, which then subsequently been uh, reformulated as an antibody drug conjugate. So this was approved, uh, first approved uh, in 2011, and then uh, most recently in Australia in 2014 for the treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma, as well as anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Uh, unfortunately, the, the cost on the use of this um, of um, accessories for treatment is rather high. So, um, you know, it'd be good to have good um, insurance coverage. All right. So I see, uh, uh, is there a question? I see a hand, hand raised. But I think for discussion is after your presentation. So okay, thank you. All right. So this table here, um, I just recently updated this um, table, uh, updated as of May of this month, 2023. This uh, table here shows you a list of approved drugs deriving from marine um, natural products. What I wanted to show you is that a lot of these um, compounds or drugs are used for cancer treatment. Okay, that's one take home message. The other um, take home message is that you notice that of the 16 molecule, uh, six are coming from cyanobacteria. And these are formulated as the antibody drug conjugate. So I had a quick check at the uh, preclinical or rather clinical uh, uh, trial phase one to three testing and uh, almost 30 molecules are actually coming from cyanobacteria in the pipeline. So within the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see a lot of these cyanobacterial derived molecule coming onto, um, onto this table. Okay, so I'm going to move on to my own research now, and this is on natural product research in on marine cyanobacteria in Singapore. So when I first joined the faculty um, in 2005, I believe, uh, the first question I had was, you know, do we have any cyanobacteria at all? So I began to sort of explore the different islands. Uh, Singapore doesn't have um, a lot of islands compared to other Asian countries, but for the islands that we have, uh, I found, you know, cyanobacteria to be present everywhere. So this picture here, Sentosa, which is uh, one of the recreational uh, tourist sites in, in Singapore, uh, this picture was taken two weeks ago. And you notice, you know, the, the darker shade um, uh, shows you the, the presence of marine cyanobacteria. So the shot of it is that we find cyanobacteria everywhere. Majority of these cyanobacteria belongs to uh, the genus Moria. And you, you, I've shown this in this slide here, you see a picture of the microscopic picture of Moria producing, which is a prolific source of many bioactive compounds. So these are basically a colonial filamentous cyanobacteria. And you notice that you know, within the cell structure or within the filament, I should say, you see stacks of, uh, I, I call them pancake, uh, shaped cells stacked on, stacked on top of each other, all right? So you see here two filaments of marine cyanobacteria. All right, so one of the, one of the assays that I adopted in my lab uh, to quickly sort of screen extracts or even fractions for activity is this assay known as the brine stream toxicity assay. This assay is really easy to use, it's cheap, you know, it produced a result uh, in a sort of um, a quick manner and, um, and it's adopted by many labs in the world. So if you look at this chart, this figure here, you notice that one of the extract coming from the, the left, the rightmost uh, column, you find that the extract coming from Polar Hantu uh, Basar uh, has the highest activity. And for each extract, I usually test it at three concentration of 1,000 to a lower concentration of 10 ppm. So straight away, I would know which uh, fraction or which extract to focus on. So in addition to brine stream toxicity assay, I also run a cytotoxic, cytotoxic uh, assay based on the MOP4 
cancer cell line um, on the virus extract. And again, it shows that the same extract which showed potent activity in the brine stream assay also showed activity in terms of the cytotoxic nature. So with that, I proceeded on to you know, um, do further extraction. Now, this slide shows you, um, you know, the classical bioassay guided approach uh, way of, um, of isolating compounds from extract. So basically, um, what I start off with, of course, is the collection of marine samples. And then I bring them back to the lab. I do further extraction, fractionation using VLC, as well as uh, preliminary bio biological screening. And I forgot to add in this slide is that in addition to preliminary biological screening, I also perform proton NMR just to get a sense of you know, what compounds are present in the extract. And then um, based on the data, bioassay data as well as NMR data, I proceed with purification as well as structural, structural determination to find these uh, purify the molecule and solve the, mole the structure of the molecule. And of course, once I have the compound on hand, I will either do uh, in-house screening. Uh, so we have our anti-quorum sensing assay that, uh, that is being set up in my lab. I'll talk more about that later. And uh, also outsource some of these molecules to my collaborators uh, over at the National uh, NUS, National University of Singapore for further mechanistic studies at the Cancer um, Institute of, um, of Singapore over at NUS, as well as um, CELSI, which is right across from NIE. This is within uh, NTU for further quorum sensing inhibitory activity testing. So the first example that I want to talk about is this cytotoxic lagunamides from Lingvia majuscular. So this is one of the earlier studies that I've conducted on marine cyanobacteria from Singapore. So, uh, so this, this slide here shows you the, the proton NMR spectrum of lagunamide A. So when I first uh, isolated this compound, um, I was quite excited because you know it from the proton NMR spectrum, Trim, it revealed the peptidic nature of the com of the molecule. So uh, usually, you know, when you have proton signals, uh, you know, in a range of three point five to about five point five ppm, uh, that sort of um, indicate to me that these are either alpha or, or beta uh, protons of an amino acid. So, uh, so with that, I proceeded to obtain high resolution um, mass mass data and turns out to be uh, about 864 uh, mass supercharge ratio. And so this molecule, which is named as lagunamide A, which was obtained from Pula Hantu, uh, is a major compound. So together with 2D NMR, as well as uh, MSMS data, I was able to put the structure together fairly quickly. So this is an example of a hybrid polyketide non-ribosomal uh, peptide natural product. So if you recall the slide on the different classes of marine uh, cyanobacterial compound, uh, the first example is a hybrid polyketide non-ribosomal uh, peptide molecule. Uh, so this is one such example. So you will notice that part of the molecule is actually derived from polyketide and the rest of the compound is, 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 is coming out, is derived from amino acids or, or its derivatives. So, um, so one of the main challenges of solving the complete structure is this absolute stereochemistry. So you notice that this molecule has 11 chiral centers. So through the use of Murphy's as well as Moshe's method, uh, together with um, coupling constant values, I was able to put the, the, I was able to solve the absolute stereochemistry. Now, in terms of activity, alongside with a lagunamide A, which is the major molecule, I was able to isolate uh, two other minor compounds, lagunamide B and C. So you notice that uh, the activity is actually not too bad. Uh, in terms of cytotoxic uh, activity, in terms of nanomolar, I actually ran them through different cancer cell lines. You have P33, sorry, P388, which is a leukemic cell line. 
The A549 cell line is a lung cancer cell line. The PC3 is a prostate cancer cell line. HCT8 is a colon cancer cell line. And then followed by SKOV3, which is the ovarian cancer cell line. So you will notice that of the three compounds, lagunamide A seems to, the, to be the most potent molecule in nanomolar uh, uh, range. In addition to cytotoxic activity, these molecules also show uh, anti-malarial activity. Again, lagunamide A seems to be the most potent molecule uh, against plasmonium falciparium. And I uh, also tested, it, tested these molecules against Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and it shows anti-swarming activity. Uh, again, uh, lagunamide A seems to be the most potent compound. So this series of compounds actually spurred further sort of um, interest uh, from a, a synthetic group in China. And so they're actually developing uh, various um, synthetic analog based on the lugunamide A uh, structural template for, you know, to generate even more potent compounds. So that, that work is, is ongoing. Now I want to switch gear a little bit to talk about um, issues in natural products research. Uh, and of course, there are many challenges in natural products research. And I just want to highlight three. Uh, one of the main issues in natural product research is getting enough of the compound for further pharmacological evaluation. So I mentioned that you know, through the isolation process, you're able to, come to isolate the molecule, but most of the time, the quantity of these compounds are not very high. Uh, if you're lucky, you, know, you get a few milligrams of the molecule. Um, uh, and on average, you know, the, 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 the average weight of these compounds is, is between one to two milligram, but that's enough you know, to solve the structure of the compound. So in order to overcome the supply issue, one of the ways probably um, uh, one of the sort of innovative uh, method is through the use of genomic as well as culturing techniques. Now the second issues in natural product research has to do with dereplication. So one of the more sort of um, frustrating thing is when you solve the structures and then you find out that, oh, the molecule has been discovered 10 years ago and, and then you're back to square one again. So if there's a way to quickly dereplicate the extracts or even fractions without undergoing further purification, that would be great you know, to have a sense of what kind of chemistry is present. And of course, one of the innovative ways is through the use of metabolomic approaches. I'll discuss one, of, one such approaches in, my, in, in the subsequent case study. Now, the third issue in natural product research is the detection of structurally novel or related analogs. And again, this can be overcome through the use of metabolomic approaches. So all these issues are sort of summarized in this diagram here. And if you're interested, you can refer to this uh, publication in Current Opinion in Biotechnology, which was published many, almost 10 years ago in 2014, which remains uh, you know, relevant to this day. So what this diagram shows you is the um, top-down approaches coupled with bottom-up approaches. So I just want to start talking, uh, discussing, um, sort of briefly talk about the bottom-up approaches. Uh, so these bottom-up approaches, also known as genomic-based approaches, uh, there are different ways you can, you can sort of adopt. One way is through the use of heterologous host expression of the compound. Another way is to um, elicit production of these compounds in the native host. And the third way is through the use of bioinformatics. And this is something that I've used um, quite a bit in my lab through the use of bioinformatic tools such as anti-smash for um, you know, detection of novel uh, biosynthetic gene cluster, and then you know, try to sort of focus on that particular strain for production of molecules. So, but I'm not gonna talk about this today. So uh, now the top down approaches, there are three sort of main ways of doing it. One is through culture, culture condition screening. So you can essentially sort of change the culture condition or maybe add an you know, a, a, a eliciter for the production of molecules. So this is something that I have um, explored, but not a whole lot. Uh, it's been fairly successful. 
Now, the second method is through diverse sampling. And this is coming from, you know, looking at different eco, unique, unique ecosystem, uh, or even, you know, um, uh, less studied uh, taxonomic uh, species uh, to look for, you know, novel compounds. Now, the third way of the, um, that's related to the top-down approaches would be the molecular, would be the metabolomic approach. And one such example is the, the use of molecular networking, which I want to sort of talk about in this, um, in this talk. So um, I'm not sure how many of you, um, you know, are familiar with the uh, mass spectro spectrometric based molecular networking approach uh, for the discovery of molecule. Uh, this chart here sort of briefly describe the sort of the background information on molecular networking. So you can imagine that, um, first of all, molecular networking is a, plat is a metabolomic platform to quickly sort of provide information on, you know, some chemical information regarding the extracts uh, that you have. So in the, this, so this, this slide here shows you some of the, um, the theory behind molecular networking. So when you have mixtures of molecule in this picture here, you have about six compounds. And you will notice that four of these compounds are, you know, closely, are structurally related. Whereas the bottom two are, you know, uh, are quite different from the top four. So this mixture of molecules that contain six compounds will undergo LC, MS, MS. And each of these compounds that comes out from the LC uh, you obtain a MS-MS spectrum of the molecule. So in the center, in the center picture, you see six MS-MS uh, uh, mass spectra uh, related to the six compounds that have been eluted up from the LC. And then you submit this to a supercomputer that resides uh, over at UCSD, and it will generate a molecular network right at the top, sorry, right at the, the left, the rightmost uh, picture, where you, where first of all it will, it would, um, you will see six nodes, six dots. Each dot is a precursor ion pertaining to each of the molecule in the mixture, and you notice that the top four highlighted in red are all related, so they are connected by a dash, right? And you notice that the line, the thickness of the line, correspond to the relatedness. Uh, between the two uh, two molecules. So the cosine value of one means that the two compounds are identical, whereas you know, anything below that would be, you know, they're similar but not identical. And of course, there's a cutoff point of a threshold cosine value of 0 0.7 and right at the bottom, where, where then you begin to sort of uh, arrange the class, arrange the nodes into different clusters. So at the end of the day, you're going to have two clusters here, the four red dots and the two green dots clustered separately because of the threshold value of 0 0.7. Now, um, so I'm going to skip this two slide because I've already explained the theory behind it. Okay, so now um, you can use this platform, you know, um, you know in, from a sort of non-targeted manner or targeted manner depending on the context of your research. So for my purpose, I use it in a, actually I use it both ways, both targeted as well as non-targeted. So briefly, this is the workflow of the MS-based molecular networking platform that I've adopted in my lab. And of course, you start with the, uh, the extracts or even fractions, you know, coming off from the VLC fractionation. And the first thing to do is of course, obtain LC, MS, MS data. Now this, part, this process of, of the first step in obtaining LC, MS, MS data is the most expensive step because each fraction, um, especially in Singapore, each fraction or each sample will cost about $300, uh, Sing dollars. So, uh, so this step is the most expensive. The rest of the step, the remaining steps are all free, all right? So uh, once you obtain, able to obtain MC, LC, MS, MS um, spectral data of, of, your, of your fraction or your mixture, you then upload the spectral files on the GMPS.
Can I continue? Yes, please. Okay. All right. So, so you upload the MSMS files on GMPS, and then the spectra are then aligned with similarity scores are calculated between every pair of spectra. And then you obtain these notes um, that's shown at the at the bottom half. Notes represent compounds, and the width of the of the line represents structural similarity. And then you use another software, which is free, Cytoscape, to visualize them. So you can, you know, put in colors and so forth uh, to illustrate the compounds from different fractions and so on. And then coupled with database, you can quickly dereplicate, perform dereplication on the notes. So it allows rapid detection of known compounds or, or classes of compounds based on GMPS spectral libraries. And you can quickly annotate the notes uh, with, you know, different, uh, with information pertaining to the, um, to, the, to the compounds that are present in your extracts. Okay. So one of the sort of early adoption of this molecular networking platform is for the detection of plesiotoxin. So this is a, a targeted approach, a targeted use, approach use of molecular networking. So for the longest time, um, I kept encountering a plesiotoxin. Uh, these are nuisance compounds, which I talked about right at the beginning, uh, that can cause uh, skin uh, ir irritation as well as tumor promoters. So I thought, why not use molecular networking to see whether you know, that platform, metabolomic platform, can be used for to quickly uh, detect the presence of plesiotoxin. So I came across a, a sample of, uh, of cyanobacterial bloom, uh, which was later on identified as Trichodesmium erythesium. And this is collected from the Sea Lagoon. All right? uh, this is at um, Pulau Serangat right next to St. John's Island, uh, south of Sentosa. Sentosa is probably one of the most uh, famous island in Singapore as a tourist uh, destination spot. So in the lagoon itself, you find um, you know, blooms of this particular cyanobacteria. And one of my um, PhD students were able to isolate the compound, a uh, series of compounds that are uh, related to aplicitoxin. And he was able to find new aplicitoxin analogs. So shown here is just a proton NMR of a new analog 3 methoxy d plesiotoxin. So uh, in terms of activity, uh, we all know that in a plesiotoxin class of compounds, are uh, they can cause skin irritation. But I also submitted them for antiviral activity and showed, and these uh, three compounds, uh, d bromo plesiotoxin and hydro d bromo plesiotoxin as well as three methoxy d bromo plesiotoxin the structures of which is shown in this slide, uh, has anti-chikagunya activity. So this is the first report of aplicitoxin analogs having uh, antiviral activity. And then later on, I decided to use a molecular networking because um, you know, it'd be good to sort of quickly detect the presence of this compound so that I can avoid them uh, from sort of my personal research as well as, you know, uh, um, informing, you know, the government agency that, you know, the cyanobacterial bloom do contain nuisance compound. So, um, so I started using um, uh, molecular networking and what is shown here would be the notes um, generated from different uh, VLC fraction from one extract coming from a, a particular lo location. And I highlighted in red, so this is a molecular family that's related to the plesiotoxin structural class. And you notice there are many nodes uh, that are not, uh, th there are no matches. So this could indicate that there are new analogs of a plesiotoxin yet to be discovered. But one of the disclaimer about uh, um, molecular net networking is that you might, you know, the nodes might be detected, but it doesn't mean that you can isolate the compound because it doesn't sort of tell you that, you know, the molecule is, the quantity of the molecule is large enough to be isolated. So one of my colleagues sort of described this node as ghost node. You can see it, but you know, it's very hard to isolate them in enough quantity for structural elucidation. So I proceeded to collecting you know, different extracts from 
sorry, a different strain from different location. Um, and, I, and, and I use molecular networking. Um, and I was able to detect, quickly detect a toxin nuisance compound in all my collections. So this is um, one proposal on the use of molecular networking to quickly sort of dereplicate de compounds for, um, sorry, dereplicate fractions or extracts for nuisance molecule. Now, as I mentioned before that um, some of these analogs um, have antiviral activity. In addition to that, some of the simplified analogs of plisotoxin do contain anti-cancer activity too. So perhaps molecular networking could be a useful tool um, for the detection of new useful quote unquote analogs of a plisotoxin uh, you know, coupled with bioassays. Now the second story that I want to share with you would be uh, another class of compounds known as cyanobactins uh, that is isolated from simploca hypnoides. Now, what are cyanobactins? So cyanobactins are biosynthesized by the ribosomally synthesized and post-translationally modified peptide pathway. So again, if you recall the slide on the different structural classes of cyanobacteria, cyanobactin is an emerging class of cyanobacterial compounds. There are usually six to 20 amino acids in length and can be further modified. So the amino acids itself can be further modified, such as further heterocyclization, for example, cysteine to your other forming the thiazole or, or thiazoline ring system. Um, and then you have other serine or threonine cyclization to become your oxazoline or oxazol uh, moiety. Uh, so it's indicated in the yellow dot in this diagram. And then uh, there are other sort of modifications such as, such as the addition of isoprene or prenation and, um, and also end methylation of certain amino acids such as histidine. So all these modification, heterocyclization, prenation, and methylation, uh, particularly heterocyclization as well as macrolization, uh, confers rigidity to the compound, which could you know, arise to the different activity. So the collection of cyanobacteria, the, the uh, simploca hypnoides that I've collected, uh, so I quickly process it to different fractions again. So shown here are nine VLC derived fractions and two polar fractions. Fraction eight and nine seems to show in um, you know, a peptidic molecule. So one of the major compound, uh, this was you know, a work recently done by my uh, most recent PhD student, Zara. She isolated one major compound Fortunately, she was able to isolate about 30 milligram of this particular molecule. So when she, when she first isolated this compound and she obtained the carbon-13 NMR and it shows almost 70 carbon signals, um, I was like, wow, this is, this, the molecule is pretty big. And in fact, this is one of the biggest molecules that I've ever been isolated from my lab. Um, so with uh, persistence, she was able to solve the structure of this compound based on a high resolution MS MS data. Um, so prior to that, she was able to use 2D uh, NMR information to quickly put together nine amino acids. So you have at least four proline units present in, in this compound. And then together with MS MS data, uh, first of all, that mass overcharge ratio of this compound is over 1200. And um, with over 26 degree of unsaturation. And a shot of it is that it has anti-cancer activity against mode four, uh, sorry, against two cancer cell line, mode four, as well as AML2. Um, and what is interesting about this uh, molecule is the presence of a prenyl cyclotryptophan unit that's circled in, in blue, All right? So this is an example of a cyanobactin molecule that is produced ribosomally. So the structure of the compound was uh, further confirmed using high-resolution MS-MS fragmentation, where she was able to confirm the amino acids present in the molecule, as well as a unique uh, prenyl cyclotryptophan 
uh, moiety in the molecule. Now, of course, you can use um, Murphy's, Murphy's method to solve the stereochemistry of the regular amino acids, but the cyclotryptophan, uh, cyclotryptophan unit was a little bit tricky for us. So we spent quite a fair bit of time trying to deduce the stereochemistry of the, of the uh, cyclotryptophan unit. So the first attempt was through, uh, through the use of, uh, of course, like, uh, trichromite A. We did acid hydrolysis uh, in six normal HCl over 18 hours, and we derivatized it with the Murphy's reagent. So we used the FDVA. So this is the valine amide version of it. But the derivatized tryptophan unit was not observed. So we went back to the drawing board again and decided to reduce the heating time. So instead of prolonged heating period of 18 hours, we shortened it to four hours. And the other thing we did was instead of using FDVA, we switched it to FDAA, alanine amide analog of the Murphy's reagent. And this is because we wanted to prevent a uh, steric hindrance in the formation of the tryptophan. So eventually, uh, the derivatized tryptophan unit was observed. So in terms of the mechanism, uh, when the cyclotryptophan unit is, is, is hydrolyzed from trichromite A, one could envision that the detection, sorry, the uh, detachment of the um, isoprene unit is facilitated by the protonation of the NH, uh, shown in the lower half of the diagram, to a tryptophan uh, amino acid. And then through derivatization with FDAA, we're able to detect the derivatized tryptophan. So the FDAA tryptophan showed the same retention time as well as mass spectral data with the standard F, uh, sorry, with the standard DAAL tryptophan using LCMS. So with that, we confirm, we finally confirm the absolute zero chemistry of the cyclotryptophan unit in trichromite A. Now using molecular networking, we were able to detect analogs related to uh, trichromite A. So shown here would be a molecular family um, that is uh, related to trichromite A. And through HPLC, she was able to um, isolate further analogs. But unfortunately, trichromite E was not enough. The, the quantity of it was not enough for structural determination, but she was able to detect to determine the structures of B to D. So these are just structures of trichromite derivatives, trichromite B to D. Uh, it was recently published in Marine Drugs. And what is interesting that if you look at D, there is a um, bromine atom attached to the cyclo, cyclo uh, tryptophan unit. And through the use of MCLC MSMS data, she was able to confirm the structure. And then through the use of the experimental electronic CDs, uh, this, this is the electronic circular dichromism, able to confirm the stereochemistry of the cyclotryptophan unit to be the same as that of A, trichromite A. All right, so moving on to another story. Um, this would be, uh, I believe, the last story that I would like, like to share. This would be the cyclopropane containing molecules as quorum sensing inhibitors. Uh, this piece of work was recently uh, you know, um, wrapped up uh, about a month ago and was published uh, a few weeks ago in Molecules. So I'd like to share uh, the information uh, pertaining to this, this particular project, and maybe share with you some ecological implication as well, biomedical implication of the discovery of these cyclopropane containing compounds. Now, first of all, what, uh, you know, what is uh, bacterial quorum sensing? Uh, so just to briefly go through the, um, you know, some definition of quorum sensing. Quorum sensing basically uh, allows bacteria to detect and respond to cell population density by gene regulation. So it is a system that is used quite um, commonly in gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria in order to sense population density as well as you know, upregulation of, of gene. 
Uh, now the bacteria uses um, use quorum sensing to regulate certain phenotypes uh, expression, which in turn coordinate their behavior. Some of these common phenotypes include bowel firm formation, which is you know regulated, facilitated by quorum sensing, as well as virulence factor expressions and motility. So one of the ways of controlling bacterial infection is through the inhibition of bacterial quorum sensing. So if it can inhibit quorum sensing communication system in, uh, in bacterial system, then that could present an alternative strategy to control bacterial infection. Now this chart here shows you a uh, pseudomonas, sorry, quorum sensing system present in pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now, uh, I'm sure all of you are uh, aware that pseudomonas aeruginosa is an infectious bacterial strain. Uh, it is hard to control. This chart here shows you two quorum sensing system in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. There are actually three system, right? You have the less RHL as well as the PQS uh, quorum sensing system present in, in P. aeruginosa. What this slide shows you is just two of these uh, of the three systems, the less as well as the uh, RHL uh, quorum systems. Now, briefly, um, in each of this system, you have a uh, uh, autoinducer uh, 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 enzyme. Sorry, an enzyme that produces the autoinducer. So, at the top half of the diagram, right in red, you have the less I. I'm not sure if you can see it. less I, L A S I. So this is an enzyme that is um, responsible for the production of the autoinducer or the signaling molecule. In this case, it would be the 3 oxo c 12 hsc uh, sorry, HSL. So this is an autoinducer, which in turn will uh, bind with a transcriptional activator, LAS, LASR. So LASR is a transcriptional activator. When it's bound with the autoinducer, it will then activate further expression of LAS. LASI, which in turn produce even more autoinducer. So it's like a closed loop, right? Where more autoinducer is being produced. Now, in addition, in addition to the production of the, uh, the enzyme responsible for the production of the autoinducer, the transcriptional activator together with the autoinducer can also upregulate the viral expression of virulence factors. So if there's a way to inhibit this transcription activator, then basically you might be able to shut down quorum sensing system of Pseudomonas aeruginosa and ultimately control the infection, right? That's caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So one of the assay that I use, <coughs> excuse me, one of the assay that I use in my lab is this quorum sensing inhibitory bar assay carried out using uh, this reporter strain. Uh, so basically, this reporter strain has a less B gene that is attached to a fluorescent gene, uh, a gene that, that expresses the, the fluorescence protein, the GFP protein. So uh, but through the use of this particular strain and then screening it, use it to screen extracts, fractions, or even compounds, we're able to decide whether you know, the molecule or the fractions contains antiquorum sensing activity. Now, going back to the literature, um, one of the questions I, I have was whether, are there any quorum sensing inhibitors um, isolated from marine cyanobacteria? And this slide shows you, uh, you know, about 12 compounds or so uh, that have been reported to have quorum sensing inhibition, inhibitory activity, all right? So one of, so some of these examples, for example, limbioic acid, uh, limbic acid, uh, pectinoic acid, these are free acids, right? Free modified fatty acids having quorum sensing activity. Now, coming back to the collection of the cyanobacteria that I was working on, um, this particular sample was collected from St. John's Island. And in about uh, in 2019, I believe this was uh, in the month of October, I chanced on a, a, a cyanobacterial bloom that was happening on the island itself. I decided to collect it just out of curiosity whether you know, it contains any interesting chemistry. 
It was only recently, uh, so I've given this uh, particular sample to a, uh, to a master's student, Pahana, as well as a uh, final year project student, uh, an undergraduate student to work on. And very quickly, they were able to isolate a known compound, limbioic acid, shown here as compound one. Uh, this again, in the previous slide, has an, uh, anti quorum sensing activity. And a new uh, molecule, which we call it Bandera diene. So this is, of course, an analog of limboic acid that contains the cyclopropane uh, moiety uh, linked via ester bond to, you know, a, to form a bigger molecule known as Bandera diene. Now, the structure of any structure that contain um, cyclopropane moiety is quite uh, easy to, to sort of decipher because from the proton NMR, so this proton NMR shown here in the lower half of the diagram, uh, which is coming from fraction three, fraction three of the VLC uh, procedure, you notice that on the right most um, um, high, high field signal, you have 0 0.39 and 0 0.15 ppm. So these two um, signals are due to protons associated with the, um, with the cyclopropane uh, moiety. So, so these serve as sort of signature um, signals that's telling me that, um, you know, that the, the fraction contains cyclopropane containing compounds. Now, I went on to further test limboic acid for anti bowel firm activity, activity. And this is in collaboration with scientists over at CELSI at NTU. So briefly, <clears throat> the limboic acid uh, was observed to have anti bowel firm activity when treated with, when the bowel firm itself was treated with concentration above 500 micromolar of the free acid. So this is work and is still ongoing, trying to, to determine the mechanism of its anti firm activity. Now, coming back to the cyclopropane containing compounds, one of the observations that we made was that um, the imboic acid was actually isolated in high amounts. So from one of the fraction, fraction three, we were able to uh, obtain about 400 milligrams of this molecule, which was interesting. Uh, this is probably the highest amount that I've ever isolated. Uh, from any cyanobacterial sample, 400 milligrams of the free acid. And from molecular networking, um, you know, different analogs were detected, one of which I've already shown, benderodiene. So it shows that limboic acid, first of all, is produced in large quantity. And then you have analogs of it through the use of, you know, limboic acid by a via amide bond or, or ester bond uh, to form a bigger, you know, um, metabolites such as benderodiene. So um, one of the questions was, um, you know, so I, I sort of discussed this with my final year student, you know, what, what is the ecological implication of this, you know, in terms of in view of the cyanobacterial bloom formation and so forth. So he was actually quite creative in, in coming up with this diagram here. Uh, so this artwork is provided by my, my final year student, Daryl, Daryl Wang. And he came up with this, or in fact, both of us will you know, discuss what is the ecological implication or the chemical ecology of this series of cyclopropane containing metabolites. And uh, we sort of proposed that perhaps the reason why, you know, limboic acid was produced in such high quantity, what, four, three, four hundred milligrams, um, is that it could produce at the onset of the cyanobacterial bloom to disrupt quorum sensing system of competing microbes, right? So shown here on the left side of the diagram are competing microbes and they are communicating with each other using quorum sensing. And bear in mind that limbial acid has quorum sensing inhibitory activity. So maybe that, you know, that this cyanobacterial uh, bloom at the onset of it produce high amount of this modified free acid to disrupt quorum sensing of competing microbes. And then along the way, as bloom develops, uh, it makes use of the, the free acid to form you know, bigger defense, uh, def, uh, bigger metabolites as defensive allochemicals for you know, 
to prevent um, um, feeding by herbivores, etc. So this is an interesting sort of ecological perspective on the chemical function of this cyclopropane containing molecule. So one of the question I asked was then, well, the next question I have was, are there other modified um, fatty acid produced by other types of cyanobacteria that are isolated in high amounts? So I went back to the literature, and I was able to, um, to pick up uh, from the literature quite a number of free, modified free fatty acids that have been isolated previously in high amounts. So shown here are just a um, uh, ex few examples of these free acids, modified free acids, they were produced in high quantities. So for example, compound three in this diagram was isolated in 75 milligram. Some other molecules such as compound six, um, melingic acid was produced uh, was, uh, was obtained, almost 800 milligram of the molecule was obtained. And then pectinoic acid A, about 0.3% of the total dry weight um, is due to pectinoic acid A. So, so this is interesting observation that perhaps similar defensive strategy could be used by other marine cyanobacteria strain in producing high amounts of these unique modified fatty acids as anti with anti-infective activities. So, so one of the, one of the, uh, the other question I have was, well, uh, do these fatty acids, modified fatty acids, then uh, bind with um, the transcriptional protein? As you recall, if you recall the less um, R transcription, transcriptional activator protein that is implicated in quorum sensing. So I did molecular, uh, molecular docking of the various, um, of the various um, modified fatty acids. So in A, in this diagram here, A actually shows you the natural ligand, the autoinducer that is docked within the less R ligand binding domain, all right? So this is generated using Swiss doc. And I proceeded to using the other modified fatty acid derived from cyanobacteria, and lo and behold, they're all docked at the same site as the natural ligand. So perhaps, you know, hypothesis is that these other free, modified free acids interfere microbial signaling uh, system through the interference of, of their quorum sensing system. So this is the implication, the ecological, the chemical ecological implication. So taken together, the production of these unique lipid acids by, cyanob by marine cyanobacteria is probably widespread uh, due to their use as defensive molecules during bloom occurrence. And because of their high abundance of these high modified, uh, high abundance of these modified fatty acid, they also serve as structural template for the synthesis of diverse allochemicals that can serve as defensive molecules. So what is interesting and that's something to be, you know, to be explored further is can we then use, you know, these uh, fatty acid as biomarkers by relating the production amounts with the dynamics of cyanobacterial bloom? Uh, and one of these, uh, one of the techniques that you can use to do this is metabolomics. So this is something you know yet to be explored. Now, what about the biomedical implications? So since nature has given us huge amount of this natural nimbyl acid, if you recall, we have about almost four hundred milligram of this uh, a modified free acid. Uh, one of the thing that I was thinking of is, can we then uh, use this? free acid, and then coupled with free amines that we can commercially um, uh, obtain uh, and then form other you know, bigger metabolites. So this, I just submitted a grant on this and hopefully it gets funded. And uh, you know, if I get invited back, I'll share with you a further story on this development. So with that, I'd like to end my, uh, my talk here uh, with just three conclusion. And hopefully I've impressed on you that uh, marine cyanobacterial natural product is actually quite diverse, producing different structural classes belonging to hybrid polyketide peptides, 
polyketide as well as cyanobactin, which is a growing class of cyanobacterial compounds. It has diverse therapeutic activities ranging from anti-cancer to anti-infective agents. And through the use of bioassay, coupled with innovative technology such as uh, molecular networking, you can quickly do compound dereplication as well as detection of novel molecules. I'd like to end up with this slide here. Um, this paper, this slide here shows a figure that was obtained from a paper uh, published many years ago, about five years ago in the uh, proceeding of the National Academy of Science. Um, retrospective analysis of natural products provides insights for future, future discovery trend. I just want to focus on uh, the rate sort of line in the chart here. Uh, the x-axis shows you the year, right? So this is a sort of a, a, a temporal analysis of cyanobacterial compounds starting from 1965 all the way to 2015. And then on the y-axis, it shows you the median sort of the, uh, the Tanimoto score. So Tanimoto score is a metric used to compare structural similarity. So the short of it is that the trend uh, shows you that over time, right? Uh, sorry, starting with 1965, uh, you find that the structural similarity is very low, right? Which means that you, you know, there's a lot of novel compounds being discovered. But over time, the Tanimoto's value increases and it's sort of stabilized at about 0.6. So this suggests that the easily accessible chemical diversity for cyanobacteria was described you know, as time progresses. But one of the caveat is that you know, uh, this, is not, this is not a negative you know, thing, but is that in order to you know, um, get a, a low tiny motor score, bear in mind a low tiny motor score is a good thing because it shows uh, dissimilarity of compound is that perhaps you know you can discover cyanobacteria from unique ecosystem. So I just did a quick search on cyanobacterial work in in Asia. There's not a whole lot of of cyanobacterial chemistry coming out from Asia, uh, except for Papua New Guinea, but um, particularly in Indonesia, you know, in Malaysia, as well as um, other parts of, of other regions in Asia, there's not a whole lot of work coming out from cyanobacteria. So there is, you know, I, I, I suspect that within the next, you know, few years, there's going to be a lot of interesting molecule coming out from this part of the world uh, if you were to focus on collection of cyanobacteria from unique location. So with that, I want to thank all of you uh, for your attention. I know I've sort of gone beyond my timing. So yeah, thank you all of you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tan. It's interesting talk about the bioactive compounds of cyanobacteria with various activities for anti-malarials, anti anti-cancer, and so on. So we have already one question. So maybe we have about 10 minutes for the discussion. So we have from Joko Sensi, he asked about the uh, difference between the cyanobacteria from tropical and temperate waters in regards with the uh, structure of the uh, compounds and also the biological activities. Is there any difference? Um, that's a good question. Uh, from temp the difference between compounds isolated from tropics and the temperate region. Um, I've not done any detailed analysis, but in terms of structural classes, uh, one of, the, one of the, the major classes that seems to be a sort of overlapping would be the hybrid, um, you know, the hybrid polyketide non-ribosomal peptide class of compounds. So, um, so yeah, but a lot of the work actually is coming up from uh, the tropics. So temperate region, um, not that many, but first of, but maybe because the focus is more on, on um, marine sun bacteria collected from the tropics. But uh, some of the uh, examples coming up from, say, Okinawa, um, you know, I guess that's, that's considered as subtropical uh, slash uh, temperate. Uh, the structures are, there's some similarity with compounds isolated from uh, sun bacteria collected in the tropics.
So yeah, there's there's not much dissimilarity. I, I would say there's some some similar similarity in terms in terms of structural classes. I hope that answers your question. Okay, th thank you. So the next question is also related with the uh, conservation. So, Ibu, sorry. I'm trying to read the question. Uh, okay. And regards with the conservation, is that uh, because uh, cyanobacteria? Okay. Yeah, Actually, you might see it as potential market, but in but in its development, conservation efforts are needed. Have you thought about sustainability of its potential? So, are you referring to the production of these compounds? Uh, I think it's in regards with the conservation of the biodiversity of cyanobacteria. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I, I'm aware of a particular story where if you talk about conservation of a, say, a marine ecosystem, um, uh, that's something that you can build on in terms of, you know, looking at the, um, you know, sort of trying to link um, drug discovery with conservation of a particular marine ecosystem uh, that was sort of, um, I, I know of one example uh, in South America, but uh, yeah, that's something to, that you can consider in terms of conservation efforts uh, based on, you know, the sort of the biomedical potential of a particular organism from, found from that region or found from that specific area. Uh, because, you know, as policymakers, you know, you're always trying to find reason or why we should conserve you know, a unique ecosystem. So, so the economic, uh, I guess, the, the, the benefits from the economical development of these molecule as potential drug is a, a very strong reason for conservation. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, but yeah, but in terms of production of compounds from a sustainable sort of perspective, I've tried culturing some of these cyanobacteria in my laboratory, but I've not been very successful in terms of culturing these um, cyanobacteria collected from the environment. And maybe you need to have green thumb, you know, in order to culture them, uh, of which I do not have. So, um, so yeah, I, and also when you bring them back to a lab for culturing, uh, sometimes they don't produce because, you know, they're in a very comfortable environment, in a laboratory environment, you give them enough food and, and so forth. They might not be, they may not want to produce defensive molecules. So, yeah, so that's an issue. Of course, one way to overcome that is through genomic technique, uh, which I have yet to explore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Dan. So, okay, one more question. So from... Srivijaya. So it says uh, biodiversity, okay, perception comes in mind. How about how bioprospecting activity come along with many obstacles, blurring people's understanding of extensive chemical ecology diversities? Okay, so I guess this has to do with chemical ecology. So yeah, for the longest time, um, so I've been sort of um, quote unquote tunnel vision, you know, trying to focus on uh, you know, looking for for novel compounds, and then if the compound is not novel, or if it's or, or or if it's known, then you know back to square one again. But then I think we have to think beyond that. You know, when you isolate molecule and the molecule turns out to be not novel, or if it's a known compound, then perhaps you might want to ask some ecological questions. You know, as I presented in the last story here on the cyclopropane compound, what 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 is nature telling you? You know in terms of why are you isolating such molecule in high quantity? What is the ecological implication? And perhaps based on that sort of research on chemical ecology, that might lead to some biomedical implication as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tan. So probably in related with the um, low yield of the compounds produced by the cyanobacteria. In your experience, what is the, uh, let's say, um, ways of overcoming that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you mentioned about the yes. um, changes, the environment yes. or the media and so on. So perhaps yeah, you so, have the most one. Right. So yeah, uh, that's always a challenge. I mean, um, 
one one of the ways is of course to to have collaboration with synthetic chemists you know synthesize the molecule and generate analogs to do structure activity relationship study uh, that's always a good thing uh, so yeah i do encourage collaborative efforts with synthetic chemists uh, if you can do it yourself great you know i know a few labs uh, not only do they isolate the compound but they were also able to isolate sorry they were also able to synthesize a molecule uh, regardless of the complexity of it, even though it, it's quite challenging, but great, you know, I think that's that that's something that we should do more in terms of collaboration with other labs, uh, in terms of its uh, total synthesis and so forth, um, mm -hmm. to increase the chances of discovery. You know, the the issue is, you know, sometimes it's really pure luck. You know, uh, it's gifts from the gods. I I used to tell my my student. You know, the, I, the compounds are isolated is really gifts from the God, um, you know. I, and so if you come across a uh, lagoon and you find lots of cyanobacteria, great. You know, that is your chance to collect as much as you can. Uh, don't sting on it. So you, we collect as much as we can any time that we come across a bloom. And of course, we need to take care because some of these bloom contains toxic compounds. So... Um, so yeah, I mean, I think coupled with innovative technology together with synthetic chemistry, uh, we can overcome the supply issue, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tan. So through col collaboration, we can overcome uh, the difficulties. So I think uh, due to the time limitation, uh, we should uh, uh, end the discussion now. Thank so you. before we uh, move to the next session, so we, we will deliver uh, certificate. So, so we think for the certificate appear on the screen. So again, we thank you very much for your talk, for sharing with us. Okay, so please uh, make... Okay, perfect. So again, as the uh, token of appreciation, we, de we deliver the certificate to Dr. Lee Tong Tan from the Nanyang Uni Technology University of the Singapore. So please join to give big applause to Dr. Tan, everyone. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tan. So hope we uh, meet again next time and also collaborate. So we are uh, the Department of Aquatic Product Technology. We have also uh, work on the cyanobacteria and also in general with uh, marine natural products. So uh, see you next time. And I give back to the MC for the next session. So we have uh, Dr. Rob Kaisers already among us today. So thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Kustiaria and Dr. Lik Tongkan for a very interesting and insightful session. Ladies and gentlemen, now let's start with the second plenary station with the moderator, Dr. Safrinadia Harining Tias. Dr. Safrinadia Harining Tias is a faculty member at Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, IBB University. She is assistant professor at Department of Aquatic Product Technology. She obtained her Bachelor of Science and Master of Science from IBB University. In 2018, she finished her PhD in Chemical System and Engineering at Faculty of Engineering, Kyushu University, Japan. So without further ado, for Dr. Safrina Dia Hariding Tias, time is yours. Thank you very much uh, for Alia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good uh, evening, uh, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so now we will uh, uh, 
Here, the second speaker is the Dr. Rob uh, Kaiser. So uh, I uh, welcome to Dr. Rob uh, uh, Kaiser for this uh, uh, for the second uh, session. So before uh, you uh, explain about uh, your uh, research, so. Uh, let me to uh, introduce uh, you first. So uh, Dr. Rob uh, Kaiser is carry out uh, his uh, bachelor and PhD at Victoria University, uh, Wellington. And his thesis research is carried out under the guidance associate professor, Peter Notkoff, uh, and focus on the spectroscopy guide isolation sponge metabolite. metabolite. So now uh, he, uh, he uh, uh, appointed to a uh, faculty at his alma mater in 20, uh, to, uh, 29, uh, and currently now it, he is uh, an associate professor. So uh, this, uh, for uh, now, he will uh, talk about the spectra, mass spectric uh, approach for natural product screening. I think this uh, topic is uh, interesting because now, and we know that Indonesia is uh, many island and and we, we know also we have the uh, high biodiversity. So I think it, uh, after we uh, hear about this uh, uh, talk, uh, we can discuss about the uh, how to uh, screening the natural product, especially maybe if you uh, participant have relate with this topic, and we can discuss after uh, we hear uh, from the uh, Dr. Rob uh, Kaiser. So please, uh, Dr. Uh, Rob, uh, now uh, time is your. Uh, can you unmute? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, clearly. Uh, uh, Selamat siang. Siang, yeah. Selamat siang. Uh, thank you very much for the very kind uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, I, I always feel humble when people talk, talk about me like that. So um, thank you very much. You, you make me sound far more impressive than I am. Um, uh, I visited Indonesia in 2016 um, when I was invited to visit a, a, a UGM in Yogyakarta. And I had a wonderful time in Indonesia and uh, it's such a pleasure to be able to talk to you today, um, to continue the relationship we've that I've had with with various people, and in particular, I want to thank Dr. Kusti for uh, for the invitation to uh, to present to you today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, and hopefully, you can see that. Can you see my pictures of sponge uh, of invertebrates? Yes, we can Love. see it clearly. All right. So, um, uh, as said, I'm, I'm at the uh, Victoria University of Wellington. We're in the capital city of New Zealand, um, and uh, my group is a I guess a traditional marine natural products group in that we focus on uh, marine macro invertebrates, um, typically sponges, sometimes ascidians and other um, invertebrate species, and also macro algae. Um, so this is this is the the cover slide. This is a, a couple of structures and um, organisms that we've we've had experience with. Um, but I often like to oh, jump to this um, because I work on sponges and my name is Rob and and people also call me Bob. Um, I I I feel I am SpongeBob, and so. Um, I always I always put this in as my second slide that um, SpongeBob as a as a source of new chemistry. One day, hopefully, you know, I might be lucky enough to be involved with a project that results in in development of new understanding of of medicine and potentially uh, helping somebody with an illness. 
Um, my group, just to give you a little bit of background, um, we have, I guess, three main focus areas uh, in my group. Um, in New Zealand, we have a really difficult problem in that uh, we're a isolated island system and a lot of our indigenous um, species of animal uh, evolved with no predators. The only native land mammal that um, New Zealand has, the only native, is a bat. We have no, um, no mammal species um, that are native to our country. And so um, all of these species you see here, the rat, um, the, um, the stoat, um, the possum from Australia, all of these are introduced species and they are absolutely wiping out our native um, bird life, insects and plants. And so we do some, we have developed, um, uh, been involved with work to look at using chemical ecological tools to help try and develop new um, rat lures in particular to try and draw the rats into, into traps um, with, with better uh, efficacy, with better rates of, of attraction. Um, I am not a synthetic chemist, but sometimes we like to try and make molecules if they're not too difficult. Um, so for instance, this top molecule here, uh, melanganinone A, is a molecule that I discovered as a postdoc um, and it has anti-malarial properties. And we've explored um, making variants of this, this molecule um, and testing those for anti-malarial properties with collaborators in the United Arab Emirates. Um, molecule below here is a natural product we've isolated. We've never published the structure as yet because we haven't been able to identify the two chiral centers um, that are marked here with the, the little star. Um, so we're trying to synthesize both, um, both diastereomers here to try and figure out which compound is the natural product. So organic synthesis for us um, is usually either to do some structure activity relationships, and I heard the um, um, previous speaker, uh, Dr. Dr. Tong, um, mentioned structure activity relationships, or we do it to try um, and do something to help us with chemical identification. But without any um, doubt, our most important um, work or our main area is in identification of new natural products um, from primarily um, marine sources, um, also sometimes bacterial or terrestrial plant, but uh, primarily marine. And these are just a few simple examples from, from um, the lab over, over the years. <coughs> cool. So in terms of New Zealand, um, <laughs> New Zealand is uh, has the 10th uh, longest coastline in the world. Um, we're a reasonably small island nation, um, but because we have lots of offshore islands, our exclusive economic zone um, increases quite a lot bigger than um, just what the islands might look like. Um, I always feel a bit embarrassed when I say this uh, to an Indonesian audience, because your coastline is about what they, I think it's the fourth biggest in the world or third biggest. Um, so your, your coastline is, is way longer than our 10th. Um, and obviously your economic zone is much larger than ours as well. But what is different about New Zealand is as we go from um, northern latitudes to southern, uh, we vary pretty much from subtropical, almost tropical conditions in the top of the North Island, right down to subantarctic at um, the bottom uh, near Campbell Island. So we, we, we go from a very, very large um, and varied climactic range. Um, and then as a consequence, our biodiversity is quite distinctive. We have very different organisms in the northern part of the country versus the south. Um, and like Indonesia, uh, we sit on tectonic plates uh, where they meet. So we are a very um, geothermally and um, uh, earthquake prone country. Um, and that gives rise to interesting uh, potential bio biodiversity as well, um, along things like um, uh, vents under the ocean. So given the large diversity in geography and environmental conditions, New Zealand has, has a large coastline with high marine and, and um, uh, uh, biodiversity. So it's a great place to study marine natural products. 
<clears throat> when we're trying to find new natural products, um, I always like to think that there's two ways that we can approach this. I have a whole bunch of freezers full of sponges and tunicates and algae, um, and I don't have enough students to start in freezer one, work through all the samples, go to freezer two, work through all the samples. We need some way to, to say which sample is worth our time to look at a little bit more closely. So there's two standard ways one could do this. And by far and away, the, the most common, as I'm sure you all know, is to do a bioassay guided screening process. Take your organism, make an extract of it, run some bioassays on it, and if the, comp, um, if the extract shows a positive activity, kills cancer cells, it kills malaria, whatever your, your readout of interest is, then you can take that extract, put it through uh, a natural products pipeline to isolate the compound, run a whole bunch of NMR and mass spec spectra and identify what the compound is. So this is this bioassay guided process is definitely the, the more common way of doing it. On the other hand, you could do things the other way around. You could take your extract and look for interesting chemistry and identify your molecule first. And then once you've got your molecule, figure out uh, what it's good for. So run your bioassays after you've got your new compound or got uh, your compound of interest, I should say, based on some kind of chemical signature um, that is available to you. Now, this is just a, a, a cartoon, this slide, it's not um, based necessarily on accurate numbers, but with bioassays, with high throughput screening, you can literally do hundreds of thousands of assays in a, in a 24 hour period. You can run lots and lots and lots of extracts um, simultaneously. So that is very efficient at screening lots of things quickly. The difficulty with this is you have no idea what your compounds are. And so your, your screening uh, you will quite often rediscover known compounds very early on. Uh, sorry, uh, no, th through this process, you'll quite often rediscover known chemistry. Spectroscopy or chemical guided isolation um, is much slower. So it's much harder to run lots and lots of samples in a day. Um, so your input is much less. But because you're guided by some kind of chemical signature, you you have much greater capacity to do dereplication, which again I heard um, uh, Professor Tong talk about or mention. We want to identify early on: is this a known compound that we don't want to to spend time what, um, looking for, or do we want to try and find something new? So because we've um, we've got chemical information early on in the piece, we can prioritize. Um, extracts that will have more likelihood of having new chemistry. So overall, even though the input is less for a spectroscopy guided pr process, you've got a higher chance of finding new chemistry. The problem though is you don't know what your compounds are good for. And of course, that's a, that's a whole different problem. Um, trying to um, then, once you've got your new compound, well, I've only got one milligram, what can I test it against and, and decide what I can use it for? Here at Victoria, uh, we've had a long history in doing um, spectroscopy guided isolation, um, typically either with um, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy, which is what I did my PhD and in, in, uh, so several studies on. Um, the other one is um, mass spec guided uh, molecular networking. And I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time telling you about molecular networking in just a sec. So here's a, an output that we might get from a molecular networking experiment, uh, looking at an extract, where each of these dots represents a different compound. Or we could just look for um, interesting compounds based upon uh, um, NMR signatures and recognizing that certain um, resonances 
uh, tell us a bit about the chemistry of the molecules we are isolating. And um, this is something that's reasonably recent in our group. For those of you who um, are involved with NMR spectroscopy, this is a dozy experiment um, where we have hydrogen NMR on the x-axis and on the y-axis we have uh, diffusion and this is a way of essentially using our spectrometer to separate compounds while um, uh, they remain actually in the NMR tube. They, people talk about this as being spectroscopic chromatography essentially that we can actually isolate compounds spectroscopically um, by their diffusion. And that's something we've been playing with over the last couple of years. But what I want to do now is I just want to go back in, back in history, back in time. Um, I was very fortunate in 2016 um, to uh, be able to go on sabbatical uh, to the University of California at San Diego, where I was hosted by Professor Peter Doristein at the Skaggs School of Pharmacy. So this is um, UC San Diego, uh, and this is the, the Skaggs School of Pharmacy building that I was in. And this is Peter, very sporty gentleman. He likes to go running and bicycling and rock climbing all the time, so he always looks nice and fit. And I think that's why he looks so young as well. Um, and this is his, uh, at that stage, PhD student, uh, Ming Wang, and his collaborator, Nuno Banderas. And, um, these three fine gentlemen developed what we now call molecular networking. So Peter's lab focuses on mass spec based metabolomics as a tool uh, for natural products um, discovery. The reason I wanted to go to Peter was this picture right here. This is still probably my absolute favorite figure out of any scientific paper I've ever read. I love this picture because to me, it is so informative and so intuitive. Here we have a Petri dish, and on that Petri dish are colonies of bacteria that are growing. Um, all of these colonies were grown from um, marine sediment from just outside uh, the beach at San Diego. And what Peter did was he used what they call um, moldy, um, mass spectrometry imaging. So in this um, rectangular box here, what they do is they get a laser and they zap put parts of the, um, um, the, the agar here uh, with the laser moving along, as I'm showing here with my little pointer, at different time points or at different um, locations and they collect an individual mass spectrum for each point. And from that data, you can start to look where specific ions form. So I want to draw your attention to a couple of spots. First off, there's this gray um, bacteria here that they called SiO1. And here we have a ion at 714 mass units that overlays with that. So whatever weighs 714 is something that is only found in that bacterium. But what's more interesting is if you look carefully, there's this little yellow bacterium here that they're called SiO11. And if you look at ions that are unique to that one, they see 28669. Uh, sorry, 2869, I should say. That ion actually sits in a zone of inhibition between SiO1 and SiO11. That compound that weighs 2869 mass units um, is an antibiotic that is inhibiting the growth of SiO1. And if you look carefully, there's another little yellow colony there and the same ion overlays with that. So whatever this compound is, you can start to figure out uh, from mass spec, what it might be, you can start to do um, fragmentation of that ion and start to get fingerprint information. And you know it's an antibiotic because it has the zone of inhibition from its next door neighbor. I thought this was absolutely brilliant work. Um, and it was published in a very good journal um, a little over 10 years ago now. So I wanted on my sabbatical to go to Peter's lab and learn how to do this. 
Two days after I arrived in San Diego, Peter very kindly invited me and my family for lunch. But he's a very busy man and he's got a lot, a big group. So he said, Rob, it's been a while. I can't quite remember what it is that you want to do while you're here for six months. Can you just remind me what, what you want to learn about? And I said, Peter, microbial imaging mass spectrometry. I, I think that's amazing. Can you tell me more about it? And he went, oh, yeah, we don't do that anymore. So I kind of went mm, and died a little bit inside. What was I going to spend my six months doing? Oh, it's actually five months and then one month of holiday, actually. Don't tell anybody. What we learned about was molecular networking. Um, and this actually proved to be a far more valuable experience than what I would have learned if I was focused on the imaging mass spectrometry. And this all uses what they call the GNPS platform, which some of you may have heard of before. Global Natural Products Social Molecular Networking. If we think about traditional mass spectrometry, and we put an ion into a mass spectrometer, and it fragments, most people or most um, alignment software to compare two spectra, so we've got compound A, compound B, and we're trying to compare their fragmentation patterns, most of them just look for, do the ions line up? So it would say, yeah, these two green ones are the same, probably the same thing. Yeah, the two blue ones are probably but the same. So these are probably related molecules, but it takes no notice of the fact that the two red ones are there, but they don't line up perfectly. So you may not get a good match between your two spectra, and let's, for argument's sake, say that compound A, we know what that is. If we're trying to identify what B is, if it doesn't line them up, it may not associate these two compounds together. Even more so, a lot of um, alignment software don't take into account the intensity of the ions. So green is very big here, but very small here. Blue is very big here and small there. Most software won't factor that into the alignment. So this... Um, this alignment, which has been done traditionally, is not very efficient. What GMPS does is it uses a different vector-based matching. So this is how it works. If we take the mass spectrum for the fragmentation of a compound, so let's say we have compound A, we break it apart in the mass spectrometer, it will form, let's say, three ions x, y, and z. We can plot x, y, and z on our three dimensions in a, in a normal Cartesian three-dimensional way. So we can plot ion x on the x-axis, ion y on the y-axis, ion z on the z-axis. We can then figure out where those three vectors meet. Uh, all those three uh, ion intensities meet, I should say. And from that, create a vector that describes that point. So it comes out at this angle and it goes this far to where those three ions intersect. We can do the same thing with compound B. We can take its three ions and we can put that into our three dimensions and also plot out that vector. What we can then do is compare the two ions through the cosine score. So the cosine between those two vectors tells us how closely related they are. If the cosine score is one or close to it, they, they line up perfectly. And therefore you would, the, um, the hypothesis would be they are related molecules. Or if the cosine score is close to zero, they are probably unrelated. So let's take an example now where we've got um, a second, a third compound, and we'll call it B prime. Now, if you just watch this animation, watch these ions here. I'm just going to march out a little bit. So this is an analog structure. The ions are shifted a little bit differently, so they wouldn't be picked up by this old um, form of spectral alignment because they no longer line up. They no longer overlap um, in uh their mass to charge ratio. But if we vectorize these, all that happens is that vector is a little bit longer. 
it still points in exactly the same direction. And so when we overlay B to B prime, our cosine score is essentially one. So it's telling us that even though they're different molecules, they are very closely related. So this is a way then to get around um, poor alignment by uh, reducing everything to a, a, a cosine score. Um, this, is, of course, is a simple version. We're only looking at three, um, uh, three axes. Um, mathematically, it gets more challenging if you have more than three ions then, because now you're plotting uh, vectors in four, five, six, eight-dimensional space, which is far too difficult for me to understand, but mathematicians are used to this. So they just plot this data uh, in multi-dimensional space, and you can still result in a single uh, vector with its cosine score. How do we do this um, practically in the laboratory? Well, we use what we call a tandem mass spectrometer. This is the rough design of one. So our sample is introduced. We run a single um, mass spectrum where we are just analyzing all of the compounds that are present and each one has its own individual ion. And using software, we can tell the machine, if you detect a new ion you haven't seen before, select that ion. That ion gets preferentially um, sorted by mass spec one. It then gets fragmented in a collision cell here, and it generates using a, the second mass spectrometry component, we get the fragmentation pattern for that ion that was um, uh, selected in the first stage. <laughs> And this can all be automated. So this is what they call untargeted metabolomics. Just let the computer decide which, which compounds are new, which ions are new, automatically smash them apart and register their mass spectra. So here we would have one, two, three, four, five, six ions. We could plot that in sixth dimensional space and create a vector from this spectrum here. Here's a, a standard experimental setup in terms of the mass spec design. This is a QTOF. We have a quadrupole that does that first scan. We have a collision scale, uh, cell that breaks the molecules apart. And then we have our time of flight mass spectrometer to detect the fragment ions. And because it's a time of flight, this can be done with high levels of mass accuracy. So we can look at um, what the molecular formula of our ion is. So once we've got our, um, our different um, fragmentation patterns, we can start to look at networks like this. <clears throat> so these numbers, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, 0 0.6, those are the cosine scores. So here we have molecules A, B, and C. A and C are related with a cosine score of 0.9. These ions are all nicely matched. These ones are quite similarly matched, but they're on a slightly different uh, M over Z value. So we might say this is a closely related molecule, A and C. And similarly, A and B are also closely related, maybe not quite as good as A to C. We have D and G, molecules D and G. They are quite closely related to each other. And um, a and G are, are reasonably closely related as well, with a cosine score of 0.6. Finally, we have E and F, and they are, again, very closely related to each other, but they are not closely related to either A or G. The cosine scores are 0 0.2 and 0 0.3. So they are getting close to zero. These are not close relationships between E and F and the other two. We can then start to plot out a network of what these molecules might be. A, B, and C are all closely related to each other. G and D are closely related to each other. And there is a link between A to G. In our molecular networks, we often use the thickness of the line that connects the two, what we call the two nodes. The thickness is a representation of the cosine score. So A and C, closely related. A and B, um, reasonably closely related, and um, B and C, very closely related. G and D, nicely closely related, not so strong between A and G. And E and F are off by themselves. Both are closely related to each other, but not to either of the other clusters. So we can start to pull out 
a um, picture of what the relationship between these molecules is. <clears throat> um, and we can you know, we can visualize these groupings. Um, uh, uh, here's a slightly more um, realistic example looking at uh, metabolites of um, tryptophan uh, or biotin. Um, this is um, based off real data, I believe. And for instance, 5-hydroxytryptophan and tryptophan are going to be related to each other. Um, but 5-hydroxytryptophan is not related to acetyltryptophan or tryptophamide. Both of these two molecules will be related to the parent. So here's parent tryptophan. It is related to all three uh, materials. Um, and uh, depending on the cosine score, we get different thicknesses of the lines. But now we can also overlay the mass spectral data and start to think about, well, what's the difference in mass between um, hydroxytryptophan and tryptophan? There's a mass difference of 16. So that is probably an oxidation event between the two. Uh, 42 mass units is uh, related to acetylation. Um, and uh, a one mass unit difference would be um, going from a um, calcosomic acid to the corresponding uh, amide. And the same thing could be said for um, the biotin. And this is now actual real data where molecular networks can be shown. Um, and different groupings give different information. So we have a whole bunch of, um, uh, in the yellow here, uh, related um, peptides and uh, lipopeptides and glycerides. So for instance, uh, LPG, a bunch of uh, uh, glycerol ceramides. Um, and that is actually, that cluster is reasonably closely related to here where we have a sugar bound um, uh, lipids. And you can imagine that these lipid chains and these lipid chains will give similar fragmentations. So we would expect them to be reasonably closely related. Up here, we start to get into surfactants and other um, peptide molecules. And again, they all cluster close together because they are related families of compounds. And then uh, you start to get isolated groups of, of compounds that are a family within themselves, but not necessarily related directly to anything else. And you can, then you can start to ask questions. For example, you might color code things based on wild type versus mutant and start to ask things like ecological questions. So for instance, whatever this cluster is, it's only associated with wild type. As you've created a mutant strain of something, you have removed the ability of the, the organism to produce that compound, that group of compounds. So I just want to go through a couple of case studies of using this GMPS tool. Um, lichens are a really interesting symbiotic organism. Now, this isn't marine-based, to be fair, but this is the first group of organisms that uh, I worked on. Um, they, uh, it's a com complex symbiosis between a fungal host and a either a bacterial or a cyanobacterial um, symbiont. And in fact, now there's examples of fungal, bacterial, and cyanobacterial organisms living in a three-way symbiosis. Um, and although uh, New Zealand only constitutes about 0.1 to 0.2% of global land mass, um, New Zealand has about 10% of all described lichen species. We're a really um, unique place where lichens just seem to grow. Um, so I have a collaboration with um, one of my biology co colleagues, Jeremy Owen, um, and he specializes in biosynthesis. Um, and uh, we, we started a project to look at the chemistry of New Zealand lichens in relation to their uh, biosynthetic potential. So Jeremy sent over um, 25 lichen extracts each of which have been separated into six fractions um, for me to analyze in San Diego. We analyzed these using QTOF LCMS using both positive and iron negative modes. And very few of these um, the detected compounds, um, I should say the GMPS tool has a database of fragmentation patterns. So the first thing it will do is it will try and match your detected compound to a database, but it will also look at grouping those as families. Very few of our um, compounds uh, were um, had hits in the database. So, and of the ones that were, most were flavonoids or lipids. So this is the negative iron mode data. Each color represents a individual lichen species. So if we zoom in a little bit, 
what we were kind of hoping to see are uh, isolated clusters of color that say, hey, this is a family that only belongs to that lichen. So, and that's exactly what we saw. We've got the, this pink one here, sort of browny green, yellow, um, another green one, another pink one, and there's plenty of others. These are families of compounds that are produced by a unique lichen species. We did the same thing in positive iron mode, um, similar sort of story, except that there's just a lot more data here because more compounds ionized in positive iron mode than negative. And again, if we zoom in, same sort of thing, isolated clusters that are associated with individual organisms, a lot associated with whatever the pink organism was. One thing I always like to really drill home to my students, we can run our mass spectrometer to detect either positive ions or negative ions. And most people only, or most many groups in the world only analyze positive data because that's um, usually more things are detected that way. But I always say there's a real um, amount of richness that you can get, way more information that you can use uh, if you run in both modes. So here are two clusters, both color coded the same because they come from the same organism um, that are run in the two different modes. The first thing I want to highlight is that there is a whole bunch of relationships where one ion in negative mode is two mass units lighter than a corresponding node uh, in positive mode. And this is kind of expected. The standard way we ionize in positive mode is to add a hydrogen, add one mass unit. The standard way to ionize in negative mode is to lose a proton, lose H+, and therefore lose one mass unit. The net difference between the two should be two mass units. And that is exactly what we see. 518 to 520, 476 to 478, 552 to 554. So these are probably the same compounds ionizing in both ion modes. And that's really helpful then because that gives us additional information for being able to dissect what um, uh, the molecular formula might be. The other thing that's really interesting is... Um, looking at the mass differences between some of the ions. I've circled a whole bunch here that are 33.98 mass units different. And for the longest time, this made me very, very, very confused. It took me a long time to figure out what that was. Other ones, a little bit more obvious, 18 mass units, that's a dehydration. That's 18 mass units is water. 14 mass units is a CH2. So it's probably the difference between an OH and an um, OCH3. Um, 15.99 is a single oxygen. So that's um, a, a, this one is probably an oxidized version of that one. So those numbers make sense. 33.96 did not. And so I figured out that that is the difference between going from 1H to 35 chlorine. So these molecules that are 35, um, sorry, 33.9 mass units higher, this is a chlorinated version of that. Um, this one is a chlorinated version of that. This one is a chlorinated version of that. This one is chlorinated from that. So this one must be two chlorines from that one. So you can start to pull together quite a bit of information quite rapidly from looking at the mass differences. <clears throat> so there's take home messages from this, lots of information in, um, by combining both modes of ionization. Typically less compounds ionize in negative ion mode. Therefore, we get less background noise. If you get if your compounds ionize in negative mode, it's always better. Way more sensitive, way less background noise. Um, <clears throat> and that typically occurs with acidic compounds that are happy to give away their proton. So here's our some of that mass spec data that we started to generate uh, for that, that brown cluster. We ran it through and looked more closely. The blue, um, the red trace here is the positive iron mode data and the sort of the bluey green is the negative iron mode data. And you just see the peaks are much bigger. There's a lot more things detected in the negative iron mode. Um, um, but when we do the fragmentation, parent is uh, 552 and negative 554 and um, positive. It has a three to one ratio. So we this is chlorinated uh, as we would predict. And we see that we've got these corresponding um, two mass unit differences here, um, as would be expected for the different ion um, start points. Um, 
that tells us a bit about the fragmentation, but then they start to line up. And again, we can pull out more information about the from that fragmentation pattern to start to identify these compounds. And um, <clears throat> some of these losses equate to loss of carbon monoxide, uh, which is uh, 28, um, I believe. And then that is often diagnostic for peptides that lose carbon monoxide during the fragmentation. We did a quick little bit of, um, I'm not going to call it bioinformatics because it's not, uh, it's not it's not even chemometrics or chemo or, or metabolomics. We just did a little bit of number crunching, and that was done by um, a postdoc in Peter's lab, uh, Ricardo Silva. And we just thought we would compare the two iron modes. Because we're doing this at high mass accuracy, we want to include that in our, in our um, analysis. So one hydrogen, one proton, weighs 1.00783 mass units. And if we go from negative to positive mode, that is a difference of two of those. So we looked for what's the difference um, between the two um, ion modes, looking for a difference of two times 1.00783. In negative ion mode, we detected uh, about 5,500 um, nodes across our whole data set, and about double that in positive ion mode. When we looked for um, nodes that corresponded between both modes with a difference of 2.01 to 2.02 mass units for our two hydrogens, it was only about 1,200 that were shared between both. Or roughly 20% of negative ions and only 10% of positive ions. So what that means is, um, flipped on its head, only about well, about 80% of negative ions will only ionize in that mode. And 90% of ions will only positive, um, ionize in positive mode. That, that's a, a very simplistic um, uh, view. And there are some um, important um, uh, considerations that, be, that we have to take into account when we uh, look at these numbers. But this is, a, this is one simple um, rough estimate that you could make. So again, this to, to me drives home the fact that if you only run positive mode, yeah, you're going to get a lot of chemistry, but you're also going to be missing out on a lot of compounds that only ionize in negative ion mode. Okay, <clears throat> that was the lichen story. I want to jump a little bit to the kingdom of Tonga. So our group has also been lucky enough to collect samples from Tonga, which is a, um, a Pacific island nation in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, it constitutes about 1,200, no, about 800, sorry, um, islands uh, across three main groups, the Tongatapu group, the Hapai group, and the Vavao group, um, which uh, are about 1,000 kilometers, 1,200 kilometers apart. Of the seven, 800 islands in the archipelago, only about 100 are, um, are inhabited. So most of the islands are uninhabited. Tongatapu is the main group, and um, Tongatapu is the main island in Tonga. Um, the capital city is Nukualofa. Uh, the population of Tonga is about 150,000, and 90% or so of the nation live on Tongatapu. This is the island of Aowa, uh, here just down to the bottom right. And between Aowa and Tongatapu is about 10 kilometers of um, ocean. So they're very close in terms of distance. But what is quite amazing to me and a lot of other people is that Aowa is the oldest island in the entire Pacific Ocean. It's about 6 million years old, which is about 5 million years older than Tongatapu. So this, this island um, has arisen from um, tectonic activity. Um, here's um, a, a trench, um, the Tongan trench, um, that uh, um, uh, comes from um, tectonic plates, while the other islands in the group all come from um, formation of coral reefs and uplift of coral, coral atolls. So even though the islands are very close, they're actually very different in terms of their um, biodiversity. And um, Aowa has just been there for that much longer that um, organisms had had a chance to um, evolve differently than on the newer, um, younger island. So when we've compared chemistry from 
uh, Tongatapu versus chemistry from Aowa, we often find that Aowa specimens are just that much richer in, in chemistry than uh, ones from Tongatapu. So I had a PhD student, um, Dr. Joe Bracegirdle, who actually visited Indonesia um, a few years ago while he was a student and was hosted by Dr. Kusti uh, for a workshop there. And he had a wonderful time in Indonesia as well. Uh, Joe looked at um, a bunch of um, tunicates, um, not sponges, but tunicates, also marine invertebrates, um, for their um, natural product diversity um, using molecular networking. And he came across this um, group being, I believe it's this one, yes, yeah, this red one here, from Didenum turneratum. And he, when he analyzed the data, he found that there was largely three groups of ions that came together. There's this one group out here to the right, another group here, sort of in the top of this cluster, and it's a bit difficult to, to discern this initially, this bottom group here. Now the color coding is quite unusual here. He's color coded these based upon how the uh, where the ions came from after we put the, the extract of the organism through a reversed phase chromatography column. So anything that is colored red is a polar fraction. Anything that's colored blue is a mid polarity fraction. And anything that's colored green is a, a non-polar fraction. So what we're seeing is actually three clusters based on polarity of the, of the compound. Um, this, these two top clusters are polar in nature, and the bottom cluster is less polar in nature. When he started to analyze the mass spectrometry data, here's our fragmentation pattern. Um, the parent ion was 610 mass units. It had a diagnostic loss of 80 between 610 and 530. That is diagnostic for loss of SO3 minus. So probably from a sulfate or sulfonate group. Then two subsequent losses of um, uh, 15 mass units is loss of methyl groups. And with a lot of um, NMR data, uh, we were able to put together some substructures like so, and then start to look at databases of known compounds. And from that, we were able to identify that we had a variety of new compounds that are called lamellarins. Now, the lamellarins were originally discovered in 1985 by my former boss, Raymond Anderson. Um, but what was different about ours was that ours were sulfated. Most of the original lamellarins and most of the known ones are non-sulfated. So we'd found sulfated variants. And so Joe identified six new ones. Um, and... Previous to our discovery, there had only been nine sulfated ones out of over 100 compounds. So we extended that by yeah, over 50% from nine to 15. And it was the first new ones to be discovered in 20 years. Um, and the lamellarins um, have potential antiviral properties. Um, we were unable to test it for antiviral properties. We didn't have access to antiviral assays. And in our hands, these were very weak um, cytotoxins, so they're not going to be a, a new anti-cancer drug or anything like that. So when we go back to our GMPS network then, what we can start to do is actually look at, well, what compounds did we discover? Joe's new compounds were all the sulfated lamellarins here, and he as I said, we discovered six. Some of the other ones in these cluster are some of the known ones. The other polar compounds were phenolic lamellarins. So if I just skip back a slide. So ones where instead of having a sulfate, this is an OH. Um, and you'll see a lot of these also have um, methyl groups, methyl ethers. That explains why we were seeing the loss of methyl groups as uh, part of our fragmentation pattern. But a lot of these are sulfate, uh, sorry, uh, phenolic as well. So we have our sulfated ones. We have our non-sulfated but, but um, phenolic lamellarins, and again, they would be very polar. And then as we start to add methyl groups in, we start to get the non-sulfated but methylated lamellarins as this cluster here. So we can actually start to make sense of our family once we know what the compounds are. Just for the chemists, I don't know how many of you are all chemists. Um, hopefully, um, this may be of, of a little bit of interest to the chemists amongst you. Um, 
lamellarins can be chiral. So we have this, this benzene ring here, and because it has groups ha hanging off it at the three position, um, and there are these groups on the backbone of the skeleton, that makes this benzene a, a chiral plane. We normally think about chiral centers um, only being at a single carbon with four different things attached to it. But if the, the, um, there's a plane that cannot rotate around and it's locked in a position, that can also be chiral. So here we have the R and the S possible enantiomers of the lamellarins. When we're talking about chiral um, planar chirality, that's called atropisomerism. So we calculated um, the chirality using um, computational chemistry. Uh, what the um, uh, the uh, electronic circular dichroism spectra would look like, which is different and reversed for both possible and antimus, and then compared our calculated for the um, uh, to our experimental and deduced that we had the R form of the um, natural product, not the S. And our experimental um, ECD spectra for all of our isolates um, was the same. And as far as we're aware, this is the first time anybody's been able to determine um, absolute configuration in lamellarins. Having said that, Back in the uh, mid-1990s, Rob Capon's group from Australia also pointed out that lamellarins could be chiral. Um, and they found lamellarin S, all, um, all hydroxyl groups, except for this one methyl group, um, chiral plane here. And they measured um, the optical rotation of the molecule um, stored in a fridge at four degrees. Um, over the course of about a year and, and monitored the loss of um, um, chirality, or I guess the racemization, the loss of chiral purity um, over that time. And they figured out that there's a half-life of about 90 degrees of, of if you start with one of um, the chiral forms, it can slowly rotate through. The half-life of that is about 90 days, which works out to be a barrier to rotation of about uh, to a yeah, barrier of rotation of about 84 kilojoules per mole. And we thought, oh, that's pretty cool. Let's see whether we can do something similar. So with that, that was done back in the mid-90s when computational chemistry was pretty, um, pretty new and wasn't very good. So we used more modern DFT calculations and figured out that actually um, the barrier is probably closer to 100 and 106 kilojoules per mole, which would account to a half-life of about 112 days. And that's pretty close to what they measured experimentally with their approximately 90 days. So that we felt pretty happy with this, that 112 versus 90, 106 versus 84, those are pretty good comparisons between experimental and calculated data. And this was um, based upon a four degree storage in the fridge a refrigerator as the sample was stored at uh, for Capon's group. However, what really surprised us was when we calculated for our compounds, so lamellarin B1 sulfate, now if you note we have a lot more methoxy groups, um, including here these two positions, which should be the ones that would block rotation, actually what we find is our molecules have lower barriers to rotation than lamellarin S. So even though they should have bulkier groups that should prevent rotation, the calculation says it should be easier. And that doesn't make any sense to us whatsoever. So that confused us with our first uh, analysis of computational data. So then we tried a few different things. We tried with or without solvents uh, included in the computation. We tried um, the computation with different functional groups and different force fields. And in every single case, every single time, lamellarin S, which should be um, the easiest one to rotate and have racemization, came out as having the biggest barrier compared with our compounds. And that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, and unfortunately, we have no more compounds, so we can't do an experimental check like this 
because we ran out of our compound. We didn't isolate very much to start with, and we can't measure the, um, the optical rotation through time to see whether our calculated barriers to rotation actually make sense. Now, the logical suggestion would be that um, hydrogen bonding um, could stabilize in lamellar S and not in our, our compounds. But when we model the distance for hydrogen bonding, the, the hydrogen atom is too far away to, to be logically hydrogen bound. So that doesn't make sense either. So this is a, a question we've been unable to, to solve and um, as yet haven't come up with a good hypothesis as to why the computational data doesn't feel like it's giving us a consistent result with what experiment should show us. Now, I did have another story, but I'm looking at the time. I've been going for about an hour, so I'm just going to skip over that story. It's it's not a, a mass spec based um, story, um, so I will just run through that. So um, just in summary, um, there's a constant development of new techniques. So um, new methodologies like GMPS only um, came into existence less than 10 years ago. And that provides new opportunities for us to find molecules. Um, GMPS is great. It's really information rich. Um, however, one thing I didn't mention is it's really only quite good if you have a whole family of compounds. It's not very good for identifying an individual one molecule, um, one new molecule in a mixture, because they would only they would give one or a very few nodes. It's much more easy to say, oh, look, there's 20, 20 spots all colored the same from one unique organism. That um, so detecting families of, of, of compounds is good, not so good for individuals. And I still believe NMR is is still very useful as well. I haven't talked about NMR spectroscopy for our screen, but that's something that we still um, like to do. Um, and yeah, the story I missed, I skipped over was that old scaffolds um, can still provide interesting results. So with that, I would just like to thank um, uh, various students. Um, I talked about Joe's work. I unfortunately skipped over Titusi's work. Titusi is a Tongan student. He was actually working on his own specimens he had collected. Um, my collaborators, and I definitely want to acknowledge uh, Peter Doristein for his um, hosting me when I learned about um, GMPS and funding from Fulbright, Morris Wilkins Centre and my host home institution, Victoria University. And that's all I would like to say for today. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Rob, for the nice uh, presentation. So I think uh, for us, this is quite new, especially for me, this is, uh, the information is quite new. So it's the in uh, very interesting to uh, hear about the new uh, technology to uh, discover the uh, natural product, especially from the marine. So now uh, we uh, can have discussed. So please participant, if you have the question, you can raise hand and also, or you can write in the chat box if you cannot uh, open mic, so please. While, while questions are being put into the chat, I just point out the, um, the GMPS platform um, anybody can sign up to it. Um, it's a free sign up. So if you just Google GNPS, you can sign up for it and start using the tool. There's lots of really good um, videos and um, documentation on how to use it. Um, the initial paper that described GNPS, I was fortunate enough to be included on that, it was published in 2016. Mm -hmm. I think it was 2016. Um, it's got well over 3,000 citations now. So it, it, is a, it is a very important, very popular tool for metabolomics. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of the subsequent, there's been, Peter Doristein puts out papers many times a year on further developments um, of GMPS, and all of those are cited hugely. I'm, I'm on another paper with him, a uh, protocols paper, and that's got over 1,500 citations since 2019. So, um, yeah, these are very important tools for bioprospecting. Yeah, I think it's so, uh, 
uh, now we have the participant in the right hand. So please, Dr. Christy. So thank you very much. It's nice uh, to see also the work of you, Rob. Thank you. Thank so, you. yeah, so we have a high diversity of the nature, so the resources. It's also, you have already uh, described nicely with the, uh, the equipments, I mean, uh, with the mass spectra and so on. So, uh, in case of us, because of the limitation of the equipments, so probably you can suggest. Uh, what is the most, uh, let's say, um, in minimal, uh, minimum um, equipments that we should uh, provide for that work? So thank you. Yeah, certainly. Um, and um, uh, before I forget, Tarima Kasi for letting me speak. Um, I wanted to make sure I, I acknowledge uh, my uh, um, uh, Indonesian friends and collaborators. Um, excellent question, Dr. Christie. Um, the instrumentation I showed the schematic for, the QTOF, um, is a, um, it's a, a, it's a reasonably expensive big piece of equipment. Um, and I appreciate that not every institution will be able to have a QTOF. Uh, we are very fortunate that we have had one here for, for over 10 years now. The nice thing with GMPS is it doesn't have to be a QTOF. Um, so there are less expensive instruments for liquid chromatography. So a triple quad would also be acceptable um, or an iron trap um, quadrupole. And those are often less expensive than QTOFs or more higher, higher specification uh, mass spectrometers. The difficulty for liquid chromatography analysis is it does need to be one of these double mass spectrometers, the tandem mass spectrometers. You can't just run a, um, a single TOF spectrum because you need the fragment data. That's the important thing. You need the fragment data to use the database. Um, but thinking practically for institutions, it doesn't have to be liquid chromatography. So a gas chromatography instrument, a GCMS, um, would is can interface with GMPS as well. So if people have access to GCMS technologies, and those are much more common than LCMS, um, most gas GCMS systems, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, use um, ion sources that cause fragmentation. So the GCMS data, the fingerprint from the GCMS, can be um, analyzed using GMPS. And so, um, you know, you don't have to have the world's most expensive uh, or uh, amazing LCMS system to be able to use that as a tool. I hope that answers. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, any question? Maybe for me, because uh, I have a question, because this is like quite news. I have the kind of uh, question, the technical question. So uh, how to prepare the sample? I mean, you showed before that uh, you have uh, sampled the bacteria and also spawns and, and, and others. So now this is, yeah, this is the technical question, but how to prepare? Uh, because in your conclusion that you say that it's not good if we use the single compound. So it's mean that if this is, we need some purification, fractionation, or we just, yeah, this is my question for the preparation before we uh, injected the, the sample in the, in the, the, in the uh, instrument. Yep. Thank you. Excellent question. Um, the, the simple answer is, um, I recommend, and I think it, all mass, mass spectrometry um, experts say this, um, you should do some level of cleanup, sample cleanup if you can. Um, so for example, if we think about a sea sponge, um, in fact, you can see SpongeBob directly above me there. We take SpongeBob and um, just extract with methanol and put that straight onto the LCMS, there's going to be a lot of salt from the ocean, from the seawater, 
and that will um, that will influ uh, negatively influence or make our analysis worse. So um, we um, with the lichen story I told, um, each extract had been put through a C eighteen um, little column, a little set pack column, and be had been made into six fractions. So we analysed six fractions for each organism. The lamellarin story from the um, didenum ascidian that my student Joe, so, yeah, Joe Bracegirdle, uh, he had run those, all of the extracts through a reverse phase column as well and had separated those into three. And we always just analysed the middle one, the, the, 70, the middle polarity fraction. And then if, if any hits looked good, then we would analyze the other two. Um, but we always find we get better data if there has been some initial cleanup. Okay, thank you for explanation. So we need to fractionate the, the sample and then we can check and we can choose which a fraction we, uh, we will detect it. So- and, and yeah. also concentrate mm -hmm. the sample as well. So you actually, it cleans the sample, but it also makes it more concentrated too. Uh, uh, okay, it's, clean it's a... sample is so important, right? Yeah. Okay, any question for from the participants? You can raise hand or you can uh, chat in the uh, chatting box. Ah, thank you for your uh, question. Uh, yeah. How can spectrometry be applied in bioprospecting to identify potential bioactives? Um, well, the GMPS platform, as I've shown, can tell us when we've got families of compounds. Um, you can also use workflows where you can start to scale um, the... Um, the size of the the nodes. So if we, I, I don't know whether I can go back to sharing my screen um, at all, but each each dot in the network, each spot um, represents a compound. But we can also scale how big the spots are. They can be very small or they can be very big, and we can use different criteria to um, scale those spots. And I didn't talk about that. In my in my seminar but one workflow you can do is you can start to scale the um, the size of the the spots in the network by observed biological activity so you can start to scale things according to um, uh, antibacterial activity or something like that in which case you can start to um, prioritize which spots which compounds in a network are most likely to be responsible for your um, antibacterial activity or whatever you are interested in anti-inflammatory anti-cancer you name it you can start to use workflows to identify which compounds should be the bioactives in there so then you can start to really focus on the important ones and again the gps website and documentation is very, very well written. There's lots of examples of how to use it to ask, ask those sorts of questions. Uh, there was another question here. Uh, MSTA is one of the other question here. Yeah, yeah so uh, is there any open access knowledge base of mass spec data? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to say this. GMPS <laughs> is the best, the best open source of, um, of MS data. Um, a, a lot of um, mass spectrometry data um, previously has been in databases that you had to pay for. Um, and that's that has not been good for the community to be able to um, to be able to access it. But Peter Dorostein, his view is he wants GMPS to be like Facebook. He wants everybody to be able to come together and, and be a community and work together um, and share data. So um, GMPS is freely open access. And uh, the more people that contribute 
spectral data to that database, the more valuable it becomes. So that is part of the 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 ethos the the uh, of the um, GMPS community is to share your resources, share your data, so other people can benefit from it as well. And thank you, Dr. Tong, for um, uh, providing that link. I'm, I'm sure that will be useful for the, for the readers or for the, the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe because uh, the time is uh, limited and, and so maybe uh, thank you very much for Dr. Rob for the nice uh, talking and also Dr. Tan for the uh, first present. So I will end the discussion now. So thank you very much. Uh, we hope uh, the next uh, in the future we have collaboration and also if, yeah in the research or uh, others. So uh, nice to meet you and uh, thank you very much. Now I will uh, yeah uh, to the uh, MC Alia please. Thank you very much, Dr. Safri Nadia Harining Diaz and Dr. Robert Kazers for a very interesting and insightful session. Terima kasih. But uh, before we move to the next session, there will be a give of certificate of appreciation by our moderator, Dr. Safri Nadia, to Dr. Rob Kazers. Yeah, this is uh, uh please uh uh. Uh, we send you the gift uh, as uh, appreciation for you. So this is the certificate. Maybe we will uh, send you from uh, by email. So please uh, <laughs> take the, the this appreciation. Thank you very much for nice talking. And uh, this is uh, useful for us. Uh, and then uh, we hope this can encourage us to increase the knowledge about the, especially for marine uh, bioprospecting. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. My very, it has been my great Prima pleasure. Kasi. Prima kasi. Okay, for all the participants, please fill the attendance form that already have on the screen, ipb.link slash marine bioprospecting. Okay, for all the participants, there is an announcement that Center for Coastal and Marine Resources Studies, PKSPL, IPB University, in collaboration with Arafura and Timorsi Atsi, project an archipelagic and an archipelagic and island states ice forum, supported by Department of Aquatic Product Technology, Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, IPB, will be held the fourth International Conference on Integrated Coastal Management and Marine Biotechnology, ICM MBT4, by September 12 to 13, 2023, in Grand Inakuta, Bali, Indonesia. Travel grant available for young researchers. Okay, more detail information is on the screen.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, finally, we got to the last station in this event that is closing. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank all the honorable speakers and participants for their participation and contribution and making this webinar a success. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Alia Belfast. As the master of ceremony, living with happiness and gratitude, please be safe and stay healthy whenever and wherever you are. Good afternoon. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Alia. Thank you for all.